Okay. Yes, I see you. All right. Hello to all of our guests out here tonight for International Live Stream Star Party. And if you guys are unfamiliar with the star parties at the Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory, you know that traditionally we have been nationwide live stream star party as we are streaming telescopes to you from across the United States. Well, tonight we have a little treat in store for you as we add telescopes in both Chile and the Canary Islands. And I'm Amy Oliver, the Visitor and Science Center Manager at the Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory Science Center in Amato, Arizona. And I'm so excited for all of you to be here tonight. Um, give us a little bit of leeway tonight as we have never run on slew telescopes in Chile and the Canary Islands live before. So this will be a little new adventure for us. And tonight's MC I would like to introduce to you is Stephen Brown, who lives in Green Valley, Arizona, and is a volunteer at the Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory. Stephen, go ahead and take it away. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the star party. And uh, first of all, we're going to start off with uh, Dr. Peter Maxim, who is an astrophysicist from at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He has studied at Yale. He earned his PhD at Northwestern and worked in the universe, at the University of Alabama. He specializes in observations of supermassive black holes and their host galaxies and has, at least for now, abandoned his early COVID adventures in sourdough baking in favor of running a family Dungeons and Dragon campaign and I guess chasing after your one-year-old too. So Peter, it's all yours. All right, thank you very much. Now let's uh, try to share my screen here. All right, so let's go to the slideshow. And can everyone see that okay? Hello? Yes, yeah. Okay, good, we good. We can see that, great. All right, yes. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, uh, you know, it's, on some level, it's a story about science, but it's also, uh, very much about the process of science and a very um, uh, weird sort of event that happened where here was a thing that uh, I was studying and um, and the uh, the internet conspired to show uh, me and a whole bunch of other scientists something really cool that just sort of blew our minds and uh, it's uh, you know it's it's a story about uh, serendipity and uh, the sorts of things that can happen when you are, uh, you know, it's, it's a story also about the, the, um, the excellence of people who, uh, who like to do things because it's fun. And uh, so uh, there's a lot of ways of telling this story because there's a lot of people involved, but I'm going to tell the story that I know best, which is the, which is mine. Um, and so this, uh, um, Oh dear. Okay, there we go. Oh, I have to click it. Right. So um, the the galaxy that uh, I was working on is IC fifty sixty three. Uh, IC fifty sixty three is shown here in uh, DSS uh, data. So that's uh, two color optical data taken by a uh, small telescope of the whole sky, and uh, it's uh, easy to access these images um, from uh, various data archives. And uh, it's all, uh, it's visible from the ground. So, um, you know, that's uh, sky seeing that you're seeing in the, uh, the PSFs of the, in the sizes of the, uh, the stars. And uh, uh, to give you a sense of scale, this, uh, uh, it's a couple of arc minutes across uh, this particular, um, you know, the, the core of uh, the galaxy. So um, if you could somehow force Jupiter to be, uh, up close right next to it on the sky, that's uh, that's about what it would look like, except that this is a Hubble picture. Uh, it's not very far away, and by not very far away, I mean that the light that was uh, uh, emitted, if you were to look at IC 5063 right now, would have been emitted in the time of uh, 
the late Jurassic. So when uh, you know the, the dinosaurs that we know and love from Jurassic Park, Allosaurus and Stegosaurus and Brachiosaurus, all of those things were were running around and um, uh, doing what dinosaurs do. So um, because of that, because it's you know it's big enough to get some detail, and it's really not that far away for. Uh, for a, this particular kind of galaxy, it's been studied to death. There's lots of Hubble observations. And you would think that um, basically, uh, if you were to look at it in just starlight, uh, you wouldn't see a whole lot of uh, new and exciting things. But you know, you look at something in great detail over and over again, uh, you, might, you are in danger of seeing it for the first time. You're in danger of seeing something new. And uh, also people who do that also, can develop this wonderful skill of identifying things that nobody else would identify just because um, you're so familiar with uh, the details that you expect to see from galaxies like this. Now, this particular kind of galaxy is a Seifert galaxy. Seifert galaxies, if you don't know, are named for Carl Seifert. Uh, back, when, back in the 1940s, when people were still calling galaxies nebulae, uh, he um, took spectra of various uh, galaxies with very bright cores. Uh, they had something bright at the center. And he noticed that the, the, um, uh, the spectrum, so you've got light at every wavelength. And if it were just stars, you'd see a little bit of wiggling and not a whole lot of detail. But in this case, you would see a whole bunch of what uh, would be called nebular lines. All those bright bumps that you see on that spectrum on top are nebular lines from a famous uh, Seifert galaxy uh, named NGC 4151. And uh, you know, they're called nebular lines because when you um, uh, excite gases uh, by heating it up a lot or uh, by um, irradiating it with something or running electricity through it, then you get emission at very specific wavelengths. And that's, uh, that's what causes uh, like planetary nebulae to glow in the, the, the colors that, we, that um, uh, astronomers know and love. You excite it at a very particular wavelength and you get uh, a signature of neon or hydrogen or oxygen or ionized uh, oxygen is what I'm really interested in. And uh, so uh, these, um, uh, these nebulae, um, they, each, of those, each of those colors gives you some uh, sign as to what the physics and the chemistry of what's going on in these environments that are, you know, they're really hot and uh, there's a lot of energy pumping through them, like living in a neon light. So, uh, of course, he didn't know that uh, at the time that um, supermassive black holes were common in the centers of galaxies. We know that now, but um, uh, it was a matter of speculation until a few decades ago whether they, they even existed. And uh, um, so, exactly what these supermassive black holes look like has been kind of uh, uh, an investigation of uh, decades from when we found the first quasars. What exactly is going on? It's like, um, you look at them from different angles, you look at different kinds and you see different things. And it's like the blind men and the elephant. But we've got this general picture that you've got this, this really dense object at the center, so dense that light can't escape. But I mean, you know, it, it, it creates a lot of mess around it before any of the material falls into the black hole. So you've got um, the black hole might um, be the size of the solar system, or it might be smaller. Um, and then you've got this really hot glowing accretion disk around it that um, uh, emits intense radiation. And any if any material fails to fall in, if it's whipped up by magnetic fields, because you're gonna have powerful magnetic fields that are created by this, this really hot disk, then um, it can get shot out by a jet up to millions of light years away, or sometimes these jets are small. And as you get farther and farther away from the black hole, uh, the material around it is going to be cooler and cooler because it's not experiencing as much radiation. And that's this big donut shaped structure that you see that we call the torus. Uh, we call it, it, it Taurus is shorthand for all of this cool, this very cool um, molecular gas and dust, uh, stuff that can only exist um, uh, at less than a few thousand degrees. And we know that there's a ton of it, and uh, there's some debate as to what kind of shape it takes. So uh, if you've seen uh, publicity from the Event Horizon Telescope, which the CFA uh, is a partner in, 
they resolved the event horizon of the black hole, and that's right at the inner edge of the accretion disk. So that's just a few light hours across. Uh, so that's that's uh, that's up close and personal, and that's not something that I bother myself with because I don't use those kinds of tools. I'm actually more interested in what black holes do to their environments. You know, we saw those pictures of the jets in this cartoon that we've got here. Um, very recently, uh, you may have seen uh, on the internet some press from uh, a, a German observatory called Erosita. It's a space telescope that's surveying the whole sky in X-rays. You look at the whole sky in X-rays and gamma rays, you notice these huge bubbles that are protruding from the center of our Milky Way. Uh, this is a map of the whole sky and um, these bubbles are coming from somewhere. And if you had to guess, the most obvious candidate would be that we know that there's a black hole in the center of our galaxy. And sometimes it's active and sometimes it's not. And it's not very active right now. But if it's ever been active at any point in the recent past, then it can blow these enormous, these enormous bubbles that are um, thousands of light years across. And when you've got that much um, you know, energy, that much energy being pumped into the environment of a, of a galaxy, it can uh, drastically affect whether or not stars form. It can make it, make it easier for them to form. It can, it can kill off star formation. So everything that people, you know, want to model galaxies, um, how do galaxies grow? How do they change? You've got to take that into account. So black holes are really important for understanding that. And it's really great to be able to map out these effects in other galaxies. You know, you, you think about the difference in, sky, um, in scale, the black hole is only um, a few light hours across, but the galaxy is thousands of, tens of thousands of light years across. It's, it's the exact same scale ratio between a ladybug and the size of the world. It's almost as if this entire planet was controlled by a tiny little ladybug. So that's um, uh, pretty cool and amazing. So if you wanted to study the environment of the, of the black hole, you know, if you wanted to look at the galaxy as close as you can outside of this torus structure, um, and you were looking right down the barrel of it, uh, you'd be disappointed because you get this really, if it was a, it was a really powerful bright um, quasar that uh, was being powered by a black hole, you'd be disappointed because you get a, um, a bright star that's so bright that it, it floods everything out and, and you can't see anything. So what you really want to do is, is you want to block the light somehow. And if you've got the right kind of instrument, you can um, uh, put a, a little piece of something, maybe a, a, a bar or a circle in front of it and block the light directly and then you can see everything else. And that's um, it's called a coronagraph. It's basically the same as what people use to observe the sun. Or if you happen to view an eclipse, the, uh, the moon will obscure the sun and you can see the corona, which is very faint, but it's huge compared to the sun. So um, you can do that with other bright objects. People find planets around other stars this way. Well, it turns out that supermassive black holes make their own coronagraphs. Uh, if, you happen, if you're looking at it from the, the angle on top where you're looking right down the barrel at this accretion disk, yeah, you're gonna be blinded by it. Uh, but if you're looking through the torus, the torus blocks out most of that light. And so you can, uh, um, you can start to study all of that stuff around the black hole that's being lit up by the black hole. You know, if you don't want to study the black hole's accretion disk, you just want to study the galaxy around it and how it's being lit up like a neon sign, then that's exactly what you want. So, um, so that's what I was working on. And, and to give you a... Um, a little background of what's already been done. This red image is that first image of IC um, uh, 5063 that you saw before from DSS. And in green, we've got an older, not very good image from Hubble uh, in starlight. And then in blue, we've got just doubly ionized oxygen, oxygen that's had a couple of electrons stripped off of it. And uh, so with that, um, uh, you can see here, um, you're starting to get a little more detail of what's going on close to the nucleus. But you know, um, Hubble's um, angular resolution is so much better that you've got to zoom in to see what's going on. And with the, uh, the starlight in green from Hubble, you start to see things like dust lanes popping out. And then um, you've got this bright thing that goes left to right. And uh, it looks white, but it's actually that bright because you get everything. You get the red, the green, and the blue, and that's where the ionized oxygen is. And 
if this if this galaxy were just like our galaxy, you would expect some kind of configuration like this, where the bubbles are pointing out. You've got the plane of the the galaxy that you've got this flat, um, maybe spiral or plane like structure where most of the stars and gas are, and the bubbles are rising out of it, and um, so. Um, uh, that's what you would expect to see. And the jets might be the thing that's inflating the bubbles. And on the lower left here, you've got that cartoon of the, the, the black hole with the disc and porous and jets, just to show you, you know, what it might look like if you could just zoom in to it. But that's not what's going on in IC5063. IC5063 uh, has exactly a 90 degree rotation from what you might expect from a very simple picture. Uh, it's uh, those th that bright strip that you saw in oxygen three is where the jets are going, and the jets are plowing into these these dense clouds in the plane of the galaxy. They're pumping a ton of energy in there, and then the radiation is kind of uh, partially shadowed by them, and um, uh, and it's frying wherever it does get by. It, it fries that um, that gas and ionizes it so that it glows in in oxygen three. So this is, this is neat because it makes it much easier to see what's going on when a, um, a black hole starts to influence env its environment. If you want to study how, um, how these processes change a galaxy, then you need to study the physics of how that happens. And you want you know, these powerful interactions that happen when you've got this, this black hole that's kind of askew. It's, it's tilted. It's, it's um, you know, imagine if, um, if our own black hole were really, really active and it were pointed straight at us, that would be that would be really bad. Um, so um, my supervisor, Pepe Fabiano at Smithsonian, she's interested in this kind of stuff from an X-ray perspective. And you look at it with Chandra and X-rays, um, you see that it more or less the X-rays in the contours more or less follow the oxygen three. Uh, so. Uh, it looks superficially similar what this really hot million degree X-ray gas is doing, um, but um, uh, this is not a very good uh, um, long observation. And so she thought we could do better and asked for some Chandra time and figured while we're at it, um, you can get a little bit of Hubble time when you ask for Chandra time sometimes. So let's, uh, let's get some more Hubble images too. Let's get uh, uh, more than just oxygen. Let's get some sulfur, let's get some hydrogen. And that's what we did. We, we, we looked up close right into that little strip of the galaxy right in the nucleus. And oxygen three is the old image up there in the upper left-hand corner. But we also got sulfur, which is top middle. And we got some hydrogen, which is most of the rest. And the lower right-hand corner is what you get if you um, have um, hydrogen in uh, magenta and uh, sulfur in green. And so there's a lot of new structure there that you don't see in the oxygen three. And we were, we were puzzling over this, trying to figure out what it means. Uh, and uh, about this time, while we're trying to figure out what's going on here, um, uh, was the 20th anniversary of Chandra conference in Boston. So, you know, I was attending and Pepe and, and uh, Martin Elvis were attending. They're, they're, uh, they, they're the folks who run my research group. And uh, we're all really excited about what Chandra is doing and has been doing for 20 years. But, you know, like any good scientist, um, I'm kind of half dividing my time between uh, the talks at the conference and the internet. And uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I got onto Twitter back when I worked at the University of Alabama uh, in order to uh, connect with people who are doing citizen science, but also to um, uh, also to um, make connections with other scientists. It was um, uh, you know something that I had not encountered, and it was really exciting just getting to know uh, all of these other people who uh, you know I would have to wait to. Um, to meet at conferences or send emails, but you know, you, you've you got all these people talking online. You can kind of follow their thoughts in real time. Uh, if you want to um, know what my call sign Stellar Bones is, uh, it's at least partially a Star Trek joke. See if you get that. Um, anyway, so one of the people that I and a lot of other professional astronomers follow is Judy Schmidt. Uh, if you're really interested in beautiful astronomical images, which uh, I'm assuming that a lot of you are, 
uh, you may well know about Judy Schmidt's work. Judy is uh, not a professional astronomer. She um, uh, works in um, uh, graphic design, and she, but she loves uh, she loves making beautiful images out of Hubble observations. If you looked at the observations that I had earlier, uh, you know, it, it takes a little work to make something pretty. And this, the stuff that I was producing was very utilitarian. Whereas uh, Judy is, uh, is um, not only trained at this, but also uh, has a lot of experience, is very good at it, and pours a lot of love into it. Now, her favorite image that she's worked on in the upper left is Minkowski's butterfly. Um, but all if you if you look for her name on Wikipedia, uh, you, she doesn't have an article, but you will find all of these other images that she has produced over the course of of her um, uh, of her work on uh, Hubble images. And, and you know most of these images they're proprietary for uh, something like six months, so the scientists can get a jump start on on doing their research without any, anyone stealing their work. Um, but they eventually be, become public. You can download them. And uh, Judy gets excited and gets to work almost right away and produces all of these beautiful images. So um, she found uh, back in December of last year, uh, was it December, November of last year, uh, December, I think, um, this image that Aaron Barth had uh, taken of IC5063. Aaron is um, a professor at UC Irvine, and he wanted he, he he's interested in black holes and their host galaxies, and so he just wanted a whole bunch of um, pictures of um, galaxies that have uh, a lot of hard X rays coming from their nucleus because that's a good sign that it's got a, a, a an active black hole, and so he had this big Hubble program where you know he doesn't get to pick and choose which ones get observed; it just gets picked off of his list. And um, so it becomes public immediately. It's basically Hubble needs to fill a gap in its schedule. So let's go observe that thing from a really long list. And um, so IC5063 was on this list. And the filter that uh, he had chosen was starlight because he's interested in what the stars are doing. And um, so, uh, so uh, yeah, so Judy sees some features that are at the top and, and bottom, north and south, which you might have to strain your eyes to see. But, you know, Judy is very, she, she, she looks at these things over and over again, galaxy after galaxy. So she knows when something's weird. And so she, uh, she starts talking about it on Twitter and she traces out the lines just to show everyone what's going on. And it's like, um, if, you, if you fiddle with the contrast, you see these alternations between dark and light stripes, all of them pointing at the nucleus. And it's kind of weird because, well, I mean, you know, you, yeah, we know things can, we know you can get cones pointing out from the nucleus if a, if a black hole is uh, um, accreting a lot of material and it's frying something. Um, with its ionization cones, but that's always in a very narrow uh, band and not this particular band. There, there really aren't any good emission lines in this band. And, um, uh, and also it, it lights things up, right? So why, why are we getting some dark structure here? What the heck is that? And, you know, you've got a whole bunch of astronomers following her all of them excited and curious. It's like she, she lit a beacon as if to say, you know, ah, you know, here's something where I can somehow, you know, um, throw my opinion at it and, and make a difference. And so um, astronomers do what they do when they've got a problem, they start gabbing to each other. And um, Bill Keel was my supervisor back at the University of Alabama. And he's the guy who um, first did um, the trick of modeling the distribution of starlight, if you assume that it's kind of more or less orderly, and then subtracting that model. And when you subtract the model, you see again that um, you know, to the upper left and lower right of this image, there are these dark ray-like things pointing out of the galaxy. And then you've got light stuff going in other directions. And then um, you've got uh, the same old dust lanes going from left to right that you saw in the previous images. But all of this other stuff from uh, uh, upper left to lower right, that's, um, uh, you know, that's the, that's the new stuff. And that's weird. 
Um, so Bill had the, the idea that maybe what's going on here is analogous to crepuscular rays that you see on Earth. And crepuscular rays, um, uh, crepuscular comes from the Latin word for sunset. And um, uh, basically, if you, if you cover the sun with clouds or if it's just below the horizon, you might not expect to see something except that we have an atmosphere. And so even if you block it, when the sunlight shines through the clouds, some of that sunlight's going to scatter off the the um, uh, the, mole the molecules and the water vapor and the dust in the atmosphere, and you get these beautiful sunbeams that point towards the horizon. Well, so galaxies don't have most of those things in large amounts. Um, when you when you have a whole bunch of gas spread through the galaxy, it's usually ionized, and ionized stuff is not very good at scattering this kind of light. It's usually transparent. So the number one candidate that we had is dust. We think that there's a whole bunch of dust that's just spread out through the galaxy, and it's reflecting light from this um, uh, this black hole. Which, if we could look at it directly, if it wasn't being hidden by its own torus, we'd, we'd see a quasar. Um, or you know something almost as bright as a quasar. And then other people start chiming in. And um, uh, Travis Fisher, who I occasionally collaborate with, starts looking at the emission lines. And he, he looks at um, uh, this observation from the Very Large Telescope in Chile, uh, where uh, you can see again, the doubly ionized oxygen has more or less the same pattern that shows up in the cartoon. And he's confused and, and they're all confused because well, this is not going in the direction of, um, of those dark rays. Usually if you've got something that's pointing from, if you've got a cone pointing from the AGN, um, it's kind of going in a way that it's kind of pointing out of the, uh, the galaxy or you don't see it at all. But I've been working on this for a while. And so um, people start guessing at what's going on. And I'm starting to worry that people are gonna start stepping on my territory and, and um, and uh, write a paper about the uh, uh, these nebular lines that I'm working on. So I, I you know, I, I have to chime in, and 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 all of the details you can read on Twitter. It's all out there in the open for for everyone to read. Just how this unfolded in real time. Um, but I think um, probably it's better to start uh, getting to the press release and the paper so that we can uh, unfold a little, in a little more organized manner exactly what we think is going on. So this is the press release image. And um, uh, so red and green, so you know, the, the sort of reddish hue that you see all over the galaxy is that dust, uh, is that um, starlight subtracted model that Bill made uh, in two different colors. One of them is from Aaron Barth's program, which is the one that Judy was using. Uh, on Twitter. And the other one was actually from our program because we needed a, a, an observation of starlight to, um, uh, to, to subtract it out so that you can only see those nebular lines. And um, uh, so you, you see those same dark and light features in, in both images. So we know they're real. It's not some kind of instrumental effect. These are even completely different cameras. And then uh, in the middle there, that, that sort of bluish purple line that you see across from left to right, that's um, that's what the jet's lighting up. That's the gas that's being lit up in sulfur. So uh, yeah, so we think that all of that light stuff is probably, all of that light reddish stuff is dust that's somehow intercepting um, light from the AGN outside of its ionization cone. I mean, this is, this is one of the weird things. That the, all of this is happening way, way far away from the angle where you would expect to see it. So it light hits the dust, then it bounces off, and it bounces towards you. It's like looking into a dusty room and seeing, you know, a, um, uh, a sunbeam coming through the window. And uh, where there are dust boats, you see reflection. You see sunbeams. And uh, here's the um, uh, annotation, so that you can see a little more easily what I'm talking about. You've got these dark cones, and then you've got everything else that's slightly lighter. And that's where we think that that light maybe is probably hitting the dust in the galaxy and, and making it look ever so much lighter. And you wouldn't see this, it's a very slight effect. Uh, you wouldn't do it unless you were doing what Judy was doing and unless you had these really high quality Hubble images. Uh, so um, Judy and I got to work trying to visualize all of the different scenarios that we've got to cons uh, consider. 
uh, Judy actually um, made these cartoons and um, uh, the, uh, you know, we, we had our favorite idea of what's going on, but we had to really think out, well, what else could be doing this? Because um, you don't want to be just spitballing. You want to be, you want to make a, a testable um, series of, of possible explanations um, rather than just opining blankly. So, um, so we considered several and um, uh, the, 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 one, the one that's our favorite, of course, and the one that got emphasized in the press release is the idea that you've got um, a torus, right? We know that there's a torus. We know which way the, uh, the jets are pointing, so we, and we know that we can't see the accretion disk, so we know where the torus is, too. We know exactly what angle it's at, well, almost exactly. And so um, it's, it's more or less pointing the way in the cartoon. And if you and we know also that a torus can have holes in it, and if the holes are are big enough, then light can shine through. Um, we know it's got holes from from X-ray observations. X-rays can can leak out, and it, maybe it's possible that some uh, optical or infrared light could do that too. Very small amount, probably. But um, uh, the the actual shape of the torus is is. Um, not entirely settled. And so we, um, one explanation that we um, kind of uh, uh, dwelt on was the idea that um, maybe it's not this big donut shaped thing, but maybe it's actually thinner and more disc-like. And if you've got a really, really big disc and you know, keep in mind the torus is, is a few light years across, it's huge compared to this tiny black hole. If it's big enough, then eventually the black hole's influence from gravity uh, becomes weak enough on the outer edges where the whole thing sort of loses control of itself and the galaxy becomes more important. It sort, sort of wobbles and warps. And that, if it's clumpy, then you can have big gaps where there just aren't many clumps and light shines through. Um, we consider the possibility that maybe we knew that this galaxy had had a merger at some point in the past. That's why some of the dust lanes are a little askew. And sometimes when you get a merger, if the, if the smaller galaxy goes right through it, then uh, you see in the upper left-hand corner, it'll leave these shells to the smaller galaxy pass through, and then the stars will keep going and then they'll stop and they'll start falling back towards the middle again. But when they stop, they leave some stars behind and that, that, that uh, creates these shell shape, shapes. And if, you have, if you're looking at it from just the right angle, it'll look like that fan shape in the simulation on the upper right-hand corner. So, you know, that's what the cartoon is trying to depict. Maybe those dark lanes are just where there's not much starlight because you've got these old shells that are kind of starting to lose their structure and blend together. And they, they look like they're um, uh, leaving these, these um, uh, this sort of this V-shaped structure. But um, we talked to some theorists about it and they, they don't think it's very likely. Usually you, you, you'd expect that, that V shape where there's no stars to be much wider. And these are, you know, these are like narrow cones. So um, we considered other possibilities. And there one that there's, there's um, a possibility that's still very much out in the open that um, you know how those jets are plowing into gas. Um, you know, if you zoom up close, you see the, the jet that's here. And uh, there's a, um, a dashed yellow line on that figure on the right that shows this bubble that we found in sulfur too. So it, when the jets hit stuff that's nearby, um, bubbles can, um, uh, uh, they, all of that energy has got to go somewhere. And sure, it's going to heat up the clouds, but as the gas expands and it's, gotta, it's most likely to follow the path of least resistance, which is, um, out of the galaxy away from the plane. And when it does this, it can, it can carry dust with it. And if it carries dust with it, then that, you, you might have so much dust there where it stops being uh, transparent enough where you can see the reflected light and it starts becoming kind of thick and hard to see through. So maybe you've got uh, dust in the cone that is somehow making it a dark cone. It's it's making it hard for the light to pass through, so hard that you can't even see reflected light. Or maybe you've got kind of a similar configuration where the jets are being redirected, they're, they're losing their energy and it's, it's being sent out in a perpendicular direction. And as these bubbles rise out of the galaxy, they push the dust out of the way. And if there's no dust at all, you get no reflection. If there's no reflection, there's no light. 
And so you still get a dark cone either way. And uh, so you've got um, you know, dust all over the galaxy, except where all this hot gas is bubbling outwards. So that's maybe one possibility of what's going on. Uh, and uh, the, the jury is still out on this. There's um, some evidence to believe that this, uh, this bubble scenario this, that was not covered in the, um, in the press release could be true. And that's what makes it exciting because this, uh, this whole thing opens more questions than it answers. But you know, if any one of these things were true, that would be kind of an exciting result because it, each and every one of them requires something weird that we haven't seen before in a small galaxy like this. Um, and if it does happen to be a shadow situation, and it's a shadow of a warped torus instead of this thick donut-shaped thing, it's thin and, and warped rather than donut-shaped, then we're starting to address uh, a, a controversy about something that we can't look at easily. I mean, this torus is about the size of, you know, maybe one Hubble pixel. Uh, so it's, it's hard to resolve. And this kind of shadow play that you get tells us a little something about the shape. So uh, as we're um, you know, winding things down, um, you know, the, the, the scientific results were, were just a lot of fun to talk about, really exciting, weird stuff. I mean, we, it, uh, every time I showed that picture that Bill made uh, um, to, to, to make it clear exactly how real the stuff that Judy had found was, I would show it to to, AG, to experts on supermassive black holes, and their their heads would explode, and their and their jaws would drop to the floor. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, I feel really grateful to have been part of this project. Uh, of course, Judy is the one that found it; she's the discoverer, and so uh, she's second author on the paper. I did the write up, um, but uh, you know we. Properly, a discovery like that should have a reference. And usually it goes in the references section if it's a paper. We had a little fight with the editors of the journal. And, and keep in mind, one, one of our co-authors, Lewis Ho, is, is one of the editors. So he, he would be able to tell if this is something that we could get through the editorial staff or not. Can we put her in the references section? And the answer is, if it's on Twitter, it doesn't go in the references section. It's got to be a footnote. So there's the footnote. And um, if you can take a screenshot of that, you can... Um, see the entire conversation as it unfolded. It's a little hard to keep track of exactly what's going on because it does fork at points. Um, and that's another good reason not to actually scroll through the Twitter in a talk like this. Um, but it's, it's, it's fun seeing people's brains lighting up in real time um, and how different bits of information affect um, you know, what people think of this situation. So, um, so that's about it. And um, before questions, uh, here's the link again to um, uh, the original discovery tweet, uh, or you can get it from the paper. And uh, most of the people on that paper uh, are on Twitter. So if you're curious about checking any of us out, I've put all of our, our uh, Twitter handles up. So um, several of us could have written it. There's a lot of really um, amazing astronomers who either chimed in or were already involved with the data in some way or another. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, uh, um, uh, I think a matter of, uh, well, the reason that I ended up doing it was because I was most motivated to do so and um, happened to already be uh, working on the galaxy. So I had a lot of um, uh, detailed perspective that was fresh. But you know, it was it was a real pleasure to work on this project because you know it was a real team effort, um, um, and uh, so yeah, um, I I hope you had uh, fun listening to it. Uh, I certainly had fun talking. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, got a couple questions. I think from Laura, she's wondering how long the waiting list is to focus on something through Hubble. Uh, how long is the waiting list? Okay, so um, the, oh, uh, let's see. So the, um, the waiting list for Hubble is, uh, so the, the way they organize it is usually every year around, um, uh, they have a big call for proposals around 
um, March, mid-March, and then maybe a smaller call uh, once or twice later in the year for stuff that maybe couldn't fit in the first call. And so you get a bunch of people applying from all over the world saying, here's what I'd like to observe and uh, here's why. And then uh, uh, a panel of scientists reviews each proposal and uh, gives it a grade relative to all of the other proposals they got. And then usually about a fifth or a sixth of them get approved. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. And that's the list for the year. They've got this list to choose from. And then it's not so much a matter of, of what the, the wait time is like as, well, you know, it's a, it's a satellite, right? It's, it's, it follows a given orbit. And um, it can only point at, at certain things at a certain time. So the, the real question, um, once you've been approved, is what, what are the orbits like and what did everyone else ask for? And usually they observe it sometime in the first year. Um, sometimes it can, I've never had one that's taken longer, um, but um, that does happen sometimes with space telescopes just because uh, physics is what it is. You you uh, you get in line and you you wait and see, and that's that's why they have um, these these programs that have long lists of targets which may or may not get observed because um, you want Hubble to be super efficient. You want to do the science that it's told to do, but sometimes it's impossible to observe everything that's top priority. So you've got to have some room for flexibility too. Well, improv. Okay, and from Douglas, um, he was wondering when did you get excited about astronomy and how did that influence your career, your education and career path? So uh, I got to say that the first things that excited me about astronomy were probably a kid's book that I had about uh, the planets, I think. And uh, also I liked sci-fi. I really loved Star Wars. So I was really into space. Uh, and I did take a, an, you know, I, I had a telescope when I was a kid, but it, 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 I was never able to view much in it because I really didn't know how to work it and the mount was terrible. So it would wiggle and, and everything was blurry. Um, I did take an astronomy class in high school, but I, I mainly did that for fun. And I, I was really into physics in high school because I grew up near Fermilab. It was like a bike ride away. And I thought that would be really cool. I could, yeah, I could get a job in physics and live close to home. And that's not actually how the academic job market works, but oh well. Um, and I, I got to I got to college, and I found that I was not doing nearly as well as at physics as I would like. I was getting some really terrible grades. But they, I, my 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 advisor told me, you know, maybe consider some astronomy courses, and I did, and I got I really enjoyed it, and I was doing much better. So. Uh, it was the sort of thing where I, I had this interest, but I didn't know right away that it was what I wanted to do. But I knew that I wanted to do something related to science and, and physical science in particular. So it it just took a little while to become uh, to become clear. And and you know even after that, my my career path was a little windy. I didn't go straight from college to grad school. Um, so I, I don't, I don't think I have a typical, you know, yes, I knew what I was going to do from very early and, and I've been doing it all my life. No, it's not like that. Okay. Uh, another question from Lawrence. So will you be able to use the James Webb telescope to better resolve the image and the shape of the Taurus? Um, gosh, I'm... I don't think that you could actually resolve the Taurus with James Webb. James Webb has a, maybe. Um, I have to think about some of the observing modes because um, James Webb is a really complex instrument and all of the different um, cameras do different things. So uh, maybe, I mean, there's, uh, there's an interferometer on, um, there's, you can do aperture masking interferometry with it, which lets you get a crisper picture. If you were just taking a picture using one of the ordinary cameras, you wouldn't get a better resolution. James Webb's big strengths are, uh, it's above the atmosphere, which is really important for infrared observing. And um, it's also much bigger than Hubble. And it's also uh, gonna be at a better orbit for uh, um, observing efficiency. But um, 
you're asking me whether or not one of the particular modes that I don't entirely understand is going to be useful. And maybe, maybe, I don't know. Okay, thanks, Peter. Uh, from Cassidy, was wondering what your personal first leap as an astronomer and what you feel is your most rewarding moment. Oh gosh, my first leap and my most rewarding moment. Um, my first leap, I think that probably my biggest leap, I mean, I had lots of little things that sort of drew me to astronomy over the years, but my biggest commitment was the first um, astronomy class that I took at college because I was really changing gears and thinking, well, um, maybe I ought to be doing something different, something that I, I'd be better at, something that I enjoy more. And um, it, it, was a, it was a lab class. It was um, uh, using, um, you know, uh, uh, analyzing data and using the campus observatory, which, um, and, and writing up reports of what we did. And that was, that was fun. And the professor was really nice and very patient with me. And I think that that made a difference. Um, the most exciting thing, um, oh my gosh. Uh, so when I was, um, uh, when I was at University of Alabama, I had spent, so I, I, my thesis was all on tidal disruption events, which was stars being ripped apart by uh, supermassive black holes and creating these huge flares, basically a temporary quasar where you didn't have one before. And um, uh, and they they've been very hard to find at this point. And, you know, nowadays you you see little, um, papers about them all the time, but the you could count them all on your hand, uh, all the candidates on your hand when I first uh, started doing my PhD, and when um, uh, this one in particular, when I I I saw a uh, an astronomer's telegram, I think about uh, an object that was going off at, at um, uh, further away than this galaxy, but still pretty close, um, for, further away than IC 5063, but close, much closer and brighter than anything that had ever been seen before. And it's like, oh my gosh, this thing is going to be bright for months and months and months and months. We've got to throw as much telescope time at it as possible. And so, uh, you know, I, I uh, you know, I, I, I said, I, I try to contact Chandra. Chandra, please aim your telescope at this. And they said, no, we're going to help someone else do it. And I'm like, oh, and then I, I <laughs> and then I go to that person and I say, hey, can I help you? Um, and uh, it was, it was just really exciting. And, and there's uh, you know, so much good science has come out of that particular uh, conflagration. Okay, I don't have any more questions listed. Anybody um, that does, if you have a question, get on the chat on Zoom and type it in. And, um, Actually, um, so Stephen, I think uh, what what we should do right now, um, we're waiting um, so that everyone here knows what we're, we are waiting for our telescope slot so that we can slew over and try to get a good look at IC5063. So Stephen, if you don't mind, if we can go ahead and have Frank and Derek um, start showing some of their objects. Um, they're ready, it's nice and dark over on the East Coast. Um, we can hang out over there for a little bit and then when it's time, we'll pop right back over uh, to Peter and we'll give the floor back to him um, as soon as his object is ready to come up on the telescope. Okay, that sounds good. Um, hey, and joining us again from the Emil Beeler Planetarium in Central Florida, Sanford, Florida, I believe it's where you're at. We have Frank Kane, who is an amateur, avid amateur astronomer and astrophotographer and a board member of the Central Florida Astronomical Society. During the day, he's an online educator and a software de developer. He, he kind of needs to do that to help pay for all of that astronomy gear. And of course, with him is D Derek Demeter, uh, he's the director of the Emil Beeler Planetarium at Seminole State College of Florida, where he produces and presents shows to the Central Florida community. Derek is also an astrophotographer with his photo scene on NASA's astronomy picture of the day, as well as other publications. 
In his spare time, you may find him underwater diving for prehistoric fossils or unearthing ancient rocks and minerals from around the world. Okay, guys, it's all yours. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Stephen. And of course, uh, thank you, Amy, for having us on again for this awesome star party. Uh, so uh, my, again, my name is Derek Demeter and Frank, say hello. Greetings. Good to be back. Yes. And uh, for those that have been following um, uh, our star parties since we've been doing this for a while, Frank is in a new starship, right, Frank? You have a new starship that you've, you're captaining right now. That's right. We've actually moved to uh, Merritt Island, just a few miles south of Kennedy Space Center. So this is the new home of Scopey McScopeface here, live from our driveway here on Merritt Island. That's right. And I just want to let you all know that I am uh, going to have a twin, uh, the Scopey McScopeface is going to have a twin telescope, brother, sister, what do we want to call it? We haven't decided yet uh, soon. And uh, I'm waiting for my camera to show up, but hopefully we'll be able to do double the power coming soon for future star parties. So we'll have to think of a name, Frank, for the uh, for the twin sister uh, of your scope. So uh, I have a white one and you have the, the, the black one. So it's just like, you know, um, this, this combo here. But anyways, we're going to um, take a look at two objects tonight using Scopey McScoper face as we as the telescope is called. Uh, I think we're going to do the Triangulum Galaxy first, right, Frank? Yeah, that's a good plan. It's a little bit higher in the sky right now. So uh, let's right. start with that one, shall we? Fantastic. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at kind of the location of the Triangulum Galaxy here. So what I'm going to do, I believe I have sharing capabilities. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. I just got to do one quick a couple adjustments here. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and kind of point out the location of what we're going to be seeing right now. So here I go. Let me go ahead and get that in. All right, excellent. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be kind of looking towards the uh, northeast. Uh, uh, actually, more accurately would be towards the uh, almost near zenith here. And we're going to go ahead and put up some constellation labels and uh, patterns for us to kind of see what we're looking at here. Uh, one of the more famous constellations that we can see in the sky is Andromeda, as well as Cassiopeia and Perseus. This is kind of connected to this uh, very large mythology of the story of Perseus, the hero, fighting against the monster Cetus and saving Andromeda. Well, just below Andromeda here, there's this tiny little constellation in the shape of a triangle. And that's essentially what it is. Now, I don't know if it's a hunt. It's, it doesn't look completely uh, a right, a right, a right triangle, but it looks pretty close. But located in the Triangulum um, constellation is, of course, M33, the Triangulum Galaxy, uh, which is just kind of above it there. And uh, so we're going to kind of zoom in and zoom in here. We'll be able to kind of see what it looks like from this point of view. Uh, but what we'll do is I just kind of want to show you all where you can find it. It's actually technically observable with the naked eye um, if you have really super awesome dark skies. I'm talking really dark skies. So technically, it is still naked eye visible if you know where to look, which is actually pretty cool. But through a pair of binoculars, it's really easy uh, to see there. So um, anyway, so Frank, uh, let me know when we're ready to, uh, to look at... Uh, the Triangulum Galaxy. Yeah, let's uh, point the telescope there. So I have a remote control of this thing from my office here through the magic of a network connection. So uh, let's go ahead and tell it to point to M33, which is the official designation of the Triangulum Galaxy. Excellent. And off it goes. There it goes. Oh, don't you love it? Comfort of home too. Now, of course, we're in Florida. I know we're kind of wimps to some of you people up north, but it is still kind of chilly outside. We do have a lot of humidity and it makes it so much colder, uh, doesn't it, Frank, uh, outside? So it's nice to have, you know. You know, we don't get a whole lot of sympathy about that, you know, know from our, from know, our neighbors up but north. You know what? You know what? We got to have a little bit. But hey, but then again, we, we, have, we can brag about the fact that we can tolerate the heat in the, in, in the summer, though. Some people, you know, they're that's about, true. It's just flip for us. It's flip for us. Exactly. So what we're doing here uh, is we're going to be doing we're going to be stacking multiple images. So, uh, Frank, is, uh, you want to talk a little bit about kind of the magic that we're doing here? Yeah, so right now we're waiting for our first 30 second exposure to come in from the camera that's attached to this telescope. You can't really see it from this view here. It's behind it from this angle. But um, 
Every 30 seconds, it's going to capture an image of all the photons it's collected of the Triangulum Galaxy, and it's going to stack them together. And the first one should be coming in right about now. It's so always get... the exciting part is when you see the first image. Oh, yeah, there yeah, it is. There you go. Yeah, it's that looks pretty nice. Clean. And, uh, you know, I got to tell you, Frank, since you moved to your new location, it is a darker sky. So exposing is is much better. I mean, uh, this, this single image, yeah. looks, you know, light years ahead of what you would have taken from your older house uh, with a multiple stack. So this is, this is fantastic. So uh, the Triangulum Galaxy is uh, one of the smaller galaxies in what we call our local group of galaxies. So the local group is kind of our nearby, is our neighborhood, if we will. Uh, the Milky Way is part of it, as well as the Andromeda Galaxy. And there's actually some speculation that the Triangulum Galaxy uh, was either a galaxy that interacted with the Andromeda galaxy. There's actually trails of neutral hydrogen that kind of follow between those two galaxies. And so it gives us a clue that they might have interacted with each other. But in a couple billion years from now, it's thought that the Triangulum galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy will interact as well. And there's also speculation that the Triangulum galaxy could very likely be a satellite galaxy to the Andromeda galaxy. The Andromeda galaxy is a very huge galaxy. So it kind of takes a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, you know oomph in that area of the uh, of the local group, um, but uh, it's kind of hard to see yet. But there are some really cool. If you were actually take a color image of the Triangulum Galaxy, um, you will see uh, um, these very reddish areas. And uh, what Frank is pointing at right now is actually a, uh, a large emission nebula. And just to give you an idea, if you replace that emission nebula with the location of, say, the Orion Nebula, it would be brighter than Venus in the sky. This, this is an incredibly large emission nebula, home to you know a lot of star formation, uh, home to very massive, what we call O-type stars, which are these big blue stars, very hot, uh, massive stars. And that's what gives that bright emission uh, that we see there. And we find out there's a lot of these regions all throughout the Triangle Galaxy. If you were to take a color image, Frank, I'm not sure if you have a color image of the Triangle Galaxy. I do, I do. Let's switch to that real quick. Share with everybody. If you were to take a color image, you would see all of these kind of reddish blobs throughout. And those are these star forming regions found in the galaxy here. Uh, yeah, so it's really cool. It's like a nebula spiral. in another galaxy. That's right. This beautiful spiral galaxy, it's about 2.7 million light years, a little bit further than the Andromeda galaxy, but it's still in what we consider our local group of galaxies. So this is a fantastic one. Now, uh, Peter mentioned he likes Star Wars. I, I actually read um, an article from George Lucas a while ago, and he claims that he got his inspiration of the Star Wars galaxy from the Triangulum galaxy. So is there... Is there, is that where the, the galaxy is? Is that where the Jedi live? Is that, is that where Mando and, and uh, you know, well, now we know his name, Grogu, right? Are they, are they there now? I mean, who knows, you know? Um, it, it will, <laughs> we'll let you decide on that one if you want to believe that that's where the Star Wars galaxy is, right? Now, of course, the light's traveling millions of years ago from this. So this could have been, you know, that, remember, it's a galaxy far, far away, a long time ago, that, we might be starting to see that light emerge. Exactly. I think it was actually in the script that E.T. is from here, too. That's true. E.T. could is also from the Triangle Galaxy. Is he any part of like the Galactic uh, Senate uh, during the uh, Old Republic, right? So, <laughs> all right. So, yeah, there we go. Stephen got a, a thumbs up there. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at our next object. So we looked at this massive galaxy. Now we're going to go ahead and talk about the depth actually, of... Actually, Derek, I'm sorry. Yes. I don't want to leave out the people watching us on YouTube. Oh, so uh, we have a, a no couple worries. of questions, um, and, and Stephen has the job tonight of watching on. Uh, oh, great! Chat live on Zoom, and we have a couple of questions from okay. a man named Roger on YouTube, and so he asked. Uh, I'm going to try to try to figure out um, exactly what he's trying to ask here. Um, does our galaxy produce more red or blue uh, stars now in its history? Um, because we're looking at the Triangulum Galaxy. It's an awful lot like our galaxy. Yes. Um, and I'm rude. I'm, my face isn't up here. Okay. So, um, and, and so we're asking a lot of questions about supermassive blue stars, red dwarf star, stars. Um, what about stellar nurseries? <laughs> um, what does that have to do with it? And uh, some galaxies, he said, don't have singularities. 
and why and how is that? And Peter might want to jump in and talk about that as well. So, so we'll see what you guys have to say. All right. So I think we have like multiple questions here. So what do we want to tackle first? I think we had uh, a question about the different stars in the galaxy, right? Is that one of the questions? Yeah. Or, okay. So uh, the more, the most abundant stars in our, in our universe are red dwarf stars. So uh, that would be probably, and, you know, they're very low mass uh, red stars. So they're, they're much cooler. They're smaller. Uh, these big giant beast blue stars uh, don't last very long. They take a lot of a uh, lot of of hydrogen to to you know falling into gravity to produce these stars. But um, I'm going to let Peter answer the question about the uh, singularities and galaxies because I think uh, uh, he would have a lot more credibility on that if Peter's around. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, uh, yeah. So. Um, Sorry, we're talking about uh, singularities and black holes. Uh, I, 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 I had I had someone call for my attention. Um, They're wondering some galaxies that don't have singularities at their centers. Why is yeah. that? Um, yeah. So, uh, so above a certain size, at pretty much every galaxy that we see above a certain size has good evidence for there being a black hole. Sometimes, possibly more than one. Um, it's when you get to the smaller galaxies that things get fuzzier. Um, and it, it's just hard to tell whether they have them or not. So this is an open question. It's a matter of some controversy. How common is it for these smaller galaxies to have black holes? And that's not really settled because it's much easier to tell that something's there in a, um, um, uh, a bigger galaxy where you'd expect it to be a bigger black hole and there's a lot more stuff going on um, and it's brighter. Um, but, uh, you, one example of where you might not get a massive black hole in a galaxy is if you had, uh, two galaxies collide with each other, but they didn't merge and you can get bits of it stripped off. And then that bit that gets stripped off, it starts to, you know, gravitationally contract and it starts to look like a very small galaxy. And if that happens, then, um, you might not have a black hole at all. It's also possible that the very first galaxies, um, the very first small galaxies just don't have enough mass at their centers to produce um, black holes in the long run. So that's one way it could be. And then, of course, I think there's a spec there's 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 a debate on uh, like Omega Centauri, for example, uh, whether that would be considered a large globular cluster or a dwarf galaxy. Um, so at, from what I've heard, too. So uh, things are these smaller galaxies get a little muddy in terms of you know uh the definitions <laughs> at least right. certain communities of the astronomical world any other questions amy i think that's it right now there was a comment oh, from uh, from douglas that said that water freezes at 80 degrees oh, in yeah. florida so <laughs> this is very true yes uh, we don't go in the water when it gets uh lower than 80 degrees it's too cold um, but, uh, <laughs> it's true. very true. All right. So we're going to go ahead and, uh, make our way to another object in the sky. Um, so again, we talked about this galaxy, the Triangum galaxy. Now we're going to go ahead and make our way to a, uh, what we call supernova remnant, the end, the end of a star, uh, called the Crab Nebula. So, um, so Frank, what I'm going to do real quick is I'll go ahead and point out to everybody where it is in the sky. So we are looking at the triangle area of the sky, and um, what we're going to do is we're going to back up a little bit here. And now we're going to make our way down to the constellation of Taurus the Bull. So uh, one of the more prominent constellations in the sky that's starting to emerge is Orion. If you have a fairly dark sky or maybe not such a great dark sky, you should be able to still pick out Orion with its three stars for its belt. And just above that, we can see this kind of V shape of stars we call the Hyades Cluster that makes up the head of Taurus the Bull. Now, we, we look over here in the horns of Taurus, uh, located in one of the horns of Taurus, right here by this star, Elnath, we can see that there is a, what we call a supernova remnant right here. And uh, Frank's gonna go ahead and uh, slew the telescope over to this location. Yeah, let's do it. So uh, let's go back to my control software here and we'll tell it to go to M1, the Crab Nebula. 
Off you go, Scooby. Now, this is a much smaller object in the sky relative in terms of field of view than um, the Triangulum Galaxy. So, um, so yeah. you know, when we look at images from the Hubble and other larger observatories, you know, this is a fairly small field of view in the sky. Um, I'll have to look up the exact um, uh, scale. And if anybody knows that, go ahead and post that in the chat if you know the, uh, the uh, angular um, scale in the sky. But uh, the Crab Nebula um, was actually, what's really cool about the Crab Nebula, it was observed by Chinese astronomers uh, during 1054. Um, the Chinese were actually very good at uh, paying attention to the sky because they linked the sky to kind of what was happening on Earth. The, the sky above kind of mandated what was going on for, King, for the emperor and, to, and, and other things in their lives. So they would constantly watch the sky for changes. And so some of our best documentations for comets, for soup, for, for these what we call new stars or novae, in this case it would be a supernova with this one, we, um, we have a really good documentation. Another thing is that if you're in Colorado, uh, there is a site on, in South Colorado called Chimney Rock, and they believe that the uh, Puebloans that live there actually uh, saw this, this bright star and they, they actually connected it to that rock formation there. That's a, a current, uh, the current uh, th uh, thought process in the archaeoastronomy world. So the Crab Nebula's light was visible to people from around the world. And eventually when that light dimmed down, when that star exploded, the remnant of that became the Crab Nebula. So uh, we can see that here, this kind of fuzzy patch of light here. And uh, what's really interesting is that in the center of this crab nebula. Eric, yes. I'm so sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you. However, we are actually mid slewing to um, Peter's object right now. And he okay. just got back. Miracle. Right. So I'm going to steal the share just, just for a second. Um, just so that we can show everybody um, what this looks like. And I think you guys can see what I'm sharing. I may be sharing the wrong window. Let's see if we can hurry up and fix this. I can't even get back to where we are. Stop sharing. Try again. That's, That's not the object there. I want to share with you. I'm going to share desktop too. Okay. So um, can you guys see this? Uh, see this? You can see that right in the, the middle here, there is this little, let's see if I can get something to help me out here. We'll yeah, see I see that. it. Yep. It's not that it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not that big, but it's obviously extended, right? It's kind of fuzzy. Right there. So, um, so Peter, do you want to go ahead and tell us about that? Tell us about this dot. Why does it look like this? Um, first of all, so everybody understands we're using a 17 inch telescope. It is the largest telescope at the Chile Observatory. It just came online in January of 2020. It's actually made for galaxies and star clusters and nebulae. So um, Peter, kind of talk to us a little bit about what we're seeing and, and why we see different things in different types of telescopes and why it's so small. Yeah, well, I mean, it's small because it's far away. I mean, this is, uh, you know, like I said, it's, uh, it's like 160 million light years away. So um, let's see if I can... Uh, can I zoom in on this at all? No, I can't. Not the the, the screen just doesn't do that. Okay. See if um, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, you know it's it's but it it's uh, um, it's very far away. So you know the the fact that we can even see anything at all is pretty good. There aren't very many of these um, uh, active galaxies that are so powerful. And so close to our uh, our own galaxy, so that's one way in which it's special. Um, there there are a handful that are that are brighter and easier to see, and even the very brightest one, if you want to get a really picture of it with really pretty picture with a telescope this size, you'll have to take like an hour's worth of of exposure with it. So uh, the fact that you can see anything at all is kind of neat. That's that you're basically seeing the core of stars right at the middle of the galaxy that's much brighter than anything else. And uh, you know, maybe if you zoomed in, you could see one of the bigger dust lanes. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's obviously extended. So if you did a big survey 
of all of the galaxies in the southern hemisphere for um, you know stuff that was not point-like, like a star, but rather kind of you know, spread out on the sky. This is one of the first things that you'd come up with. So uh, that's IC 5063. And it's when you start taking spectra that you start dividing this light into its composite colors that you start seeing really interesting, exciting things that you can really only get at with a uh, better angular resolution that you can get from the Hubble Space Telescope or uh, you know, better light collecting ability from a much bigger one. The fact that you can even see this at all on such a small telescope is actually really cool. Uh, it is. It's really cool. And I, I want to tell everyone, we actually didn't practice this. So here it is yeah, resolving. I... So you actually can now see a little bit of that core separated from, um, from, the, from the rest of the galaxy which is very cool um, as that happens. And so it's, it's really neat to know that we can see it with such a small telescope and it, it is gonna go away um, in just a second here. We only have five minutes. Um, and I do wanna tell everyone images from uh, tonight will actually, we're gonna make them available on our Facebook page. Um, so you'll be able to go there and any images that we looked at tonight, I'm gonna take a picture of that, couple of them. And so you'll be able to get those um, on the Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory Facebook page. So you'll have your own image of IC5063. And I'm gonna go ahead and give it back over to uh, Derek and Frank. And now we're gonna look at the Crab Nebula. We did have a question that- Oh, if, great. If um, we looked at a, the galaxy on, on a telescope closely, closer to us, would it look significantly bigger? telescope closer to us well, a, a galaxy closer to us oh galaxy no. closer yeah because if it was the same size galaxy but you know it was closer to us then sure it would it would look bigger just like anything else great well uh go ahead frank if you want to reclaim the screen thank you guys so much for being so flexible and letting us just steal time for a minute there all right, there we are. Cool. Yeah, so I mean, uh, that little interlude was great. Awesome to see some live images from Chile. And uh, we're back to Merritt Island, Florida here again, uh, just south of Kennedy Space Center. And that gave us some extra time to get a better image of the Crab Nebula here. So uh, Derek, we're starting to see some of those uh, filaments in there emerge from this image. That's right. So when this star uh, died, um, the core kept collapsing. And essentially, uh, to kind of make it, in, to make it simple, uh, Fied, uh, we eventually, the core kept collapsing to the point where basically it compacted into a dense ball of neutrons, no bigger than about 17 miles across. Um, and to give you an idea, for those that live uh, in Florida anyways, uh, that's about the size of pretty much the size of Orlando. Um, so, uh, it's, it, it, so imagine a very, very dense, heavy ball of neutrons compacted in about 17 miles across in diameter. And it is emitting incredible amounts of energy in the form of X-rays and gamma rays. But it's also creating a steady stream of, of wind that's blowing this material, essentially, and creating this, uh, this, this shape that we're seeing. Now, um, I believe it was one of the astronomers back in the early 1800s that actually named, I think it was William, uh, I can't remember his last name, but he... He talked about that this looked like, he drew it and it looked like a crab. That's people always ask, well, to me, this doesn't really look much like a crab uh, at all. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, I can maybe see a crab claw, maybe, um, you know, just maybe like a stone crab claw. I don't know. I'm trying very hard to, to try to see a crab here, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, many of these names came from the early sketches and things like that of these astronomers before photography uh, or taking photo plated uh, images were, were, were a thing. But, uh, but anyways, yeah, so that's the Crab Nebula. It's a, it's a supernova remnant. Uh, our star is not big enough to produce this kind of event. Uh, essentially, we're going to, our star is going to collapse and become what we call planetary nebula, a, a ring of gas that kind of just, you know, uh, dissolves, not dissolves, but um, expands out. And this dense, hot ball of carbon is left over to burn for a couple million years until eventually it just fades out. 
Um, but it's still cool to be able to see this. And what's really neat is that some of you might be located in places like Colorado or out west where this has been documented, or maybe you're maybe you're from maybe you're watching from China and have you know a connection with this historical record of of, of of observing this event. And and eventually we will see other supernovas that will go off and uh, eventually produce these supernova remnants. So, uh, Frank, anything else you want to add before we finish up? Yeah, one of the things that I find cool about this object is how dynamic it is. I mean, people have actually taken images of it, you know, several years apart, and you can actually see the thing expanding over time, like within our lifetimes. I mean, that's a pretty rare thing in the world of astronomy, you know? So That's right. And sometimes we can even create time-lapse imagery of this. Mm -hmm. You can actually see the expand. It's really cool stuff. And right. uh, this is uh, an image, uh, I think the Hubble oh. Space, Hubble Space yep. Telescope image. So pretty close, Frank. That's really close to that. I'm working image. on it working on it exactly um so you can see all the different colors that we have here different colors uh tell us the composition of this of the star uh, which actually give us a clue to how what happens deep within these large stars you start to fuse heavier and heavier and elements together and all the building blocks of you and i uh come from these massive stars so over time this universe recycles this material, forms new stars and eventually new planets. So the material from these massive stars that explode will be reused and, 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 and will be a byproduct of that. So uh, you, if you wanna say that you are star power, you are star power, you are star, you know, star stuff as, as the great Carl Sagan once said. So That's right. uh, it's just amazing to be able to see the story of our, of our existence occur when we observe these objects. So anyways, I think, uh, I guess if we, do we have enough time for a few more questions? I know, Amy, we're kind of on a time crunch, so we're trying to get through all these as much as we uh, can. As long as you guys continue to be super awesomely flexible so that we can say, we are now slewing. Um, <laughs> that's the, um, the one thing about a telescope where you, you know, schedule your time and then it tells you it's going. Um, it'll, uh, we have about five minutes. Okay. Until our next object slews. Um, so if you want to take a few more questions, go right ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think we have one. Um, uh, but what is the light source that uh, showing your telescope, Frank? Uh, oh, the actual like what's illuminating the telescope itself? Yeah. Oh, I put on my uh, my house lights here, so it's in my driveway. So I turn on the uh, the outside lights in front of my garage. So it doesn't <laughs> so interfere simple. with the dark sky for your telescope. And... Yeah, I mean, it does a little. If I were really taking images, I would turn it all off, of course. But uh, I have a, a large dew shield. Maybe I can show it to you here. Um, you see that little black thing on the end of the telescope? That kind of shields it from all the uh, the extra light from my garage there, so I can get away with it. Good question, though. Okay. Um, let's see, maybe one more here. Infrared light is more prevalent than visible spectrum light. Is EMF radio wave spectrum radiation most abundant of all? EMF radiation most abundant of all? That's an interesting question. Um, well, radio sources are all over, um, and, uh, uh, I would say that uh, radio sources, you know, we can pick them up from different frequencies. Um, and I, I, as far as abundance, um, I'm not quite sure uh, the answer of that. Uh, Frank, you want to take a stab at that or uh, anyone else want to take a stab at that question? I, I'm not, I'm not sure, uh, you know, you can provide a meaningful comparison, but, you know, to give you an example, when you go on to a big uh, radio observatory site, you got to turn off your cell phone because your cell phone, your one little cell phone is giving up, giving off uh, enough um, radio emission to completely mess up whatever observations they're taking. So imagine, uh, you know, 100 million people running around with cell phones and then you got the cell phone towers that are sending signals to them and you've got an idea of how much radio is flying around. Okay, I see what they're saying. I think I was misreading. I mis misunderstood. So you're talking about so sources on Earth interfering with radio astronomy. Yes. So yeah, for example, if you go to any major radio astronomy site on on the world, you know you got to turn off all any you know radio frequencies, Wi-Fi, things like that. Anything that will interfere with the tech the technology uh, that is interfering. And of course, that's actually one of the issues with Starlink. And I don't want to get into a heated debate on this, but one of the biggest issues with Starlink is uh, the frequencies that it's transmitting down to Earth. Uh, but the nice thing about it is 
you can know where a radio telescope source is. And while that satellite passes over, you can cut that frequency off for that period of time and turn it back on. That's actually one of the things that uh, Starlink, they were trying to work on with observatories uh, around the world is trying to work on the potential of, okay, we know the source sites and areas, we can turn those off. And that's actually one of the biggest uh, issues with Starlink uh, in terms of um, you know dealing with astronomy, especially in radio astronomy. Okay, now if there was a question too, it may have been answered uh, that what the most prevalent form of EMF radiation is. And I don't know if that'd be from the, they're wondering know if that's from the universe or what? EMF, so transmission. So um... I think the point is that terrestrial sources are much more prevalent than extraterrestrial, right? Maybe yeah, that's yeah, going. that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, because I would say that that would be more of an issue than uh, than what, what's going on, you know, in space. And you don't just get terrestrial uh, emission as well. I mean, you know, terrestrial sources can cause overhead reflection, right, from the ionosphere. So, you know, you get you get one thing that's emitting here. And if depending upon what the frequency is and what the atmosphere is like, it can go a long way. Exactly. Another question was infrared telescopes able to perceive more than you know, radio optical? Right. Well, it depends on what you're wanting to observe. For example, uh, visible light might be obscured by dust and other things. So infrared, uh, you know, being a longer wavelength can pass through that. So we can observe these areas and especially in the galaxy that, you know, are obscured by dust and things like that. So it really depends on what you're interested in um, trying to observe. Um, and of course, infrared, uh, you know, you can look at sources like exoplanets and things like that, where, you know, they're emitting, you know, thermal radiation, things like that. But, um, you know, so I, I really think it depends on what target you're, you're kind of interested in, in looking at. It's, it's really great for observing the early universe. Uh, if you want to see a really bright line that's emitted in optical, and you're looking at the un early universe, say, you know, you've got something that's at like... Uh, 5,000 angstroms and you're observing it at redshift, um, you know, 10, that's going to be solidly in the mid infrared. So if you want to study the, the earliest history of the universe with the first stars, then you've got to use infrared. Absolutely. So age, yeah, that, that definitely puts into play as well. Um... Okay. Um, I think we kind of got on the subject of uh, radio telescopes and a question was is the loss of Arecibo uh, replaced by other facilities? Um, I, I haven't heard anything yet. Uh, it's, it's been a, it was a huge tragedy to see that actually the University of Central Florida, which is my alma mater, uh, was uh, very involved with the Arecibo telescope and I know it really held a, a lot of a lot of friends of mine who work at the University of Central Florida were just really, really, I mean, I, I, I mean, this is something that I've, you know, I, 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 it's been a childhood dream to see this, uh, this telescope and, and, and the amazing science coming from this telescope. Um, but as far as I, I understand, I'm not, sh I'm not, I'm not aware of any um, telescope taking over the role at the moment uh, in, in substitute for the, uh, I'll receive, but I know that China is working on a very large radio uh, telescope, but um, as far as from my knowledge, I'm not, I'm not sure if anything has uh, gone, gone forward on that. There are also um, rules about uh, uh, international collaboration with China that uh, complicate matters between U.S. researchers oh, yes. and China. So this is, <laughs> yeah. this is de you know, the, the, that, that, that telescope is already built. It's in operation. But uh, and it's bigger than Arecibo was, but it's um, you know not an obvious automatic replacement because like one of the things that Arecibo was really good at doing was uh, amplifying the power of of the worldwide network, and if you can't cooperate that way, you can't just go do science with this other telescope. It's um, exactly yeah. it's not it's not simple. Um, you'd have to you know entirely replace it or build another to have that level of integration. Okay, then um, I guess well, go on. We're, uh, I just want to let everyone know, I'm sorry, Stephen, that we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. 
That also happens with telescopes. So we are sorting out uh, what, what happened to our next slew. And as soon as we figure that out, we will let you guys know. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, um, keep asking questions and uh, feel free to, to move on to our, our next objects on that side and we will figure it out on this side. Okay, we, we were still talking about radio telescopes and, and another question is, are radio telescopes the most capable of all telescopes? Radio telescopes are the most, mo most capable telescopes? Yes. Interesting. Um, well, I mean, for looking at radio signals, yes. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, again, you know, light, you know, we, we, light is, you know, seen in different wavelengths. So, uh, you know, when you again, goes back to infrared, like what Peter mentioned, it really depends on what you're, you're looking for, you know, uh, distant objects, things like that, looking for quasars and, and very far just, you know, distant objects, you know, looking at longer wavelengths will help with that. Um, and, uh, you know, but, um, you know, other wavelengths of light, depending on if you, you know, obviously radio would not work very well if you're looking at a neutron star, um, if you're interested in gamma rays or x-rays, but if you're looking at pulsations of quasars and things like that, obviously, uh, that wouldn't, would matter. But, um, again, I, I think, what I would say is, and, and, and anybody else want to chime in, it really depends on, again, what, 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 you, what you're interested in, uh, what wavelength of light you're interested in um, will determine its capabilities, I guess you can say. Um, and that's what I would, that's what I would say. So it's an interesting question. <laughs> okay. Uh, another one was, what's the farthest we can observe from ground-based telescopes? I'm, I'm assuming telescopes. They said from the ground, but we'll just put in ground-based telescopes in that. The, the farthest objects, um, <clears throat> well, I mean, pretty much whatever light we can observe. So, uh, you know, we look back, we, we can observe the, um, you know, cosmic radiation background from, from the universe. So that would be essentially as far back we can see visual, or when I say visually, I mean through light, um, you know, I would imagine that would be what, 200,000, uh, well, as far as distance, I believe the farthest object we've observed was what 40 billion light years away. Correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, on that. Um, um, I'm I'm not so uh, up to date on uh, the most distant uh, quasars, for example. Right. Um, and I, I think in terms of redshift. So you know, I I, I don't have a co I don't have a cosmological calculator in my head. Um, you but, don't. Uh, <laughs> it's just um but yeah no uh um within the first few um uh million years of the universe um if you want to pick a time from what we can see um you know at that time it was much closer than the universe has expanded so now you know the now now would be much further than than it would have been at the time that it was emitting light um but yeah, I, cosmic microwave background is absolutely right. That's something that, you know, a small fraction of it uh, used to show up on TV fuzz back when everything was analog. Okay. Well, if you don't have any further um, comments, guys, uh, Frank and, and Derek, I sure appreciate uh, all of your uh, information and your uh, participation tonight. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh and uh, thank you for again having us out and uh, we look forward to another star party in the future i well, look forward to it myself thanks for having us yeah you thanks bet. for having me thanks for being here um next up we have uh wait wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> i know perfect timing actually so um so the the little bit of weird is still still happening um, for some reason, we couldn't um, join our own mission, um, and that happens a little bit. So I always want to make sure that we're really open and honest um, about how telescopes work. And um, sometimes there might be a few little strange um, things going on. And I do want you guys to know that we were going to view um, the Helix Nebula tonight. So I'm going to show you what it would have looked like <laughs> um, ish um, if, for example, the Hubble had taken a picture of it. And I would really like, Stephen, if you would introduce Thomas Quayle um, just really quickly. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen 
um, so everyone can see the Helix Nebula. Let Thomas talk a little bit about it. And if we do happen to be able to pull images from our mission anyway, even though I couldn't share it live, uh, it was happening in front of me, but I couldn't get it to, to come over into a space where I could share it. Um, so we'll let Thomas talk a little bit and then we'll go over to Brian. Um, so go ahead, uh, Stephen, if you don't mind, if you'd like to uh, introduce Thomas, that'd be great. Okay, well, joining us tonight is Thomas Quayle, who is an education program specialist for the Clark Planetarium in Salt Lake City, Utah. He's a solar system ambassador for NASA, JPL, and an aerospace education office uh, for the Civil Air Patrol. He has been the lead organizer and presenter for stargazing events at local resorts for over 20 years conducted planetary science camps and co-founded and ran a space flight simulation program offered to elementary schools. You've been busy, Thomas, and it's all yours. That makes it sound like I'm actually quite a bit more of an expert than I'm feeling at the moment, but <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, so right here, one of the things that we're looking at uh, is the Helix Nebula. Uh, I presume that we're looking at uh, this year. Are you muted? Can I ask? We're they uh, finally cracked the Zodiac Killer's code. Oh, wow. We're going to read it once mom gets back. Where, oh, where there's the Zodiac Killer code in the background. <laughs> uh, Peter <laughs> Maxim, could you mute yourself? We're hearing all about the Zodiac Killer, and we're very excited. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, what we're looking at right here uh, is the, the, the Helix Nebula. Uh, this is a, uh, a planetary nebula, and so this is one of the things that we are looking at ultimately uh, the outcome of our own star, uh, the sun, in uh, about four and a half uh, billion years from now. Uh, the, the helix nebula kind of gets its name a little bit from the, the way that it uh, appears. It kind of looks like you're looking down into uh, this, this, this helix, and so as you do so, you're able to see the, the core remnant of the star. Uh, that will ultimately, uh, that is a white dwarf. Uh, and outside uh, and moving away from that uh, are all of these shells of gas. So as uh, stars go through their life cycles, uh, there are lots of different fates or, or outcomes that uh, they have the potential to endure. And all of this depends on their initial starting uh, mass. How much stuff do they have to start with uh, to begin with? So our own sun, uh, we're not going to uh, be this amazing, uh, super brilliant uh, death. We'll never uh, have, we don't have enough mass to have ever been a black hole. Uh, I get asked that uh, quite often from students. Uh, so our, our own sun, as it will go through its life cycle, will ultimately uh, shed out uh, its outer layers of gas and produce uh, one of uh, variations that we're able to see in this right here. So uh, the constellation Aquarius, uh, while it is not on uh, the screen that you're able to see uh, in front of you, uh, I'm looking. <clears throat> uh, so the constellation Aquarius, uh, if you were to go outside and try to kind of find this uh, right now would be kind of towards the, the southwest uh, area of the sky this evening. Uh, so, uh, if you have the opportunity to do so. Thank you, Amy. I very much appreciate your helping with the screen shares on this. All right. So uh, <clears throat> one of the things that's kind of neat about uh, this particular uh, uh, phenomena is that the uh, the outer ring expansion of, of the gas, uh, I guess, Amy, if you want to go ahead and go back to that for uh, a moment. Uh, so the outer ring uh, area of that uh, nebula that's expanding is roughly about 40 kilometers per second. Uh, the inner ring is roughly about 32 kilometers per second. Uh, now, what does this mean in terms that we can relate with? Uh, right now, the Voyager 1 spacecraft that uh, is our furthest traveled space probe uh, in our uh, 
and all of our uh, exploits, uh, is traveling at uh, roughly around 19, I believe, uh, kilometers per second or so. Uh, so uh, this, this nebula is expanding about twice the rate uh, that our Voyager spacecraft uh, is currently uh, moving on out there. So if you're looking at <clears throat> um, the, from the center to the uh, outward area, uh, you're looking uh, on the inner disk, you're looking at about uh, 6,500 years. So uh, just for some for, uh, fun perspective, if our spacecraft were traveling from the center of that outward, uh, it would take twice as long uh, or roughly not about want not. five years to get out to that same distance. Let me show you what I've got. So I'm not sure uh, how long we have on uh, any one particular object. Uh, I am uh, grateful in, in uh, helping uh, present this with, a with Amy, so with uh, her help. So if there are any questions you have, one of the things I do like doing is uh, kind of presenting some fun facts and personal relationships with astronomical phenomena with our own everyday lives. Well, Thomas, I have a question. So I want to talk a little bit about um, this being a planetary nebula, and if you can sort of talk about what that means. And I know that in, in relatively recent um, history, so within the last decade or so, um, as we've been looking at the Helix Nebula in particular, um, it's it sort of, uh, you know, NASA pointed out a few times that it almost sort of looks like it's unraveling. Um, because of because of the violent um, occurrences that are happening in within this nebula because the star is dying. Um, can you kind of um, talk about that from your perspective a little bit and and kind of just enlighten us all what does that really mean is going on? So as as stars go through their life cycle, uh, they they burn through or, or uh, generate different elements. And when, when the uh, amount of uh, energy that it's required to make new elements is no longer present, uh, gravitational forces overcome that process. But in, in, in the lead up to that, uh, you have uh, an entire variety of elements that are uh, being generated. So uh, many of you are probably familiar with uh, things like neon signs. Uh, you have all these fun colors, you know, some are bright oranges or reds or green. You have you know, the reds that say open or closed and, and whatnot. And so each element, uh, when it is, uh, uh, when it's energized or excited uh, by uh, uh, energy, uh, it, it will produce a particular wavelength. And so as, uh, as these uh, stars start to shed off uh, those gases, of course you have all of this energy that's still emanating from within the stars that's going through those uh, last cycles. And so it's, uh, in this particular instance, we're looking at a, uh, an emission nebula, which means that it's kind of producing uh, its own light. So as each of the different layers of those elements uh, are, are being blown away, we're getting the chance to kind of see uh, each one of the, the emission spectra or, or colors generated by that process. Thank you so much, Thomas. I think Stephen is, is out there somewhere and I have hijacked the MC duties a little bit um, <laughs> so that we could partner up. But uh, um, Stephen, if you're out there, uh, if you'd like to come back and uh, take over. Okay, I did have one question, an older question here I didn't get to, but uh, there was a question from Nick was wondering how the Doppler effect observed through telescopes and how are the red shift and blue shifts identified? If anybody can answer that. So, I mean, I, I, I unless uh, uh, someone else would like to jump in on that. Uh, so that, that Doppler shift, uh, how that's identified. So I, I had mentioned just a few moments ago that each, uh, each element uh, that we have uh, gives off a particular color uh, we kind of view, uh, scientists will view this as kind of like a fingerprint. So each element uh, will have very specific frequencies of energy or light that will show up uh, that is associated solely with that one element uh, or even compound. And so uh, when you're looking at uh, the spectrum 
of something, uh, you can sit there and say, okay, uh, we, we're seeing this frequency here and there's a pattern. Uh, one of the things that we, that we stress really uh, frequently is, is looking for patterns in nature uh, in the education circles. And so with uh, each element, there's a particular pattern of that frequency. So if we're looking at something moving away from us or towards us, uh, that, that shift in that frequency, what that means is that that pattern maintains uh, its structure, but all of a sudden we're, instead of like seeing like, uh, like music chords, right? Instead of seeing something in the key of C, we're all of a sudden seeing something in the key of B minor and, or, or D sharp. And so all of the, the, the pattern is still there. It's just been moved along in, in a particular frequency range. And so that's one of the ways that we're able to identify when something is either moving towards or away from us is looking to see how much that key has changed. And a follow up to that was uh, what different gases results in the colors of a nebula? Uh, so that will that will uh, depend entirely on uh, how much stuff uh, was, uh, I guess, ultimately present at the beginning. Uh, a lot of times, uh, so a star won't necessarily fuse all of its hydrogen. Uh, you have the outer layers, of course, that are still going to have some of that uh, in the helium. Uh, as you go through the, uh, the periodic table, uh, basically you're kind of going all the way down through uh, the various elements. I guess, I don't know if that's really explaining it too much. Uh, iron is the, is the heaviest element that stars can uh, generate through the fusion process. Uh, anything higher than hydrogen, or sorry, uh, higher than iron uh, is generated through other processes, uh, including supernovae. Okay, I think that's all of the questions. Uh, Tom's thank uh, for your participation and the information they gave us. Hope you come back another time. Okay. With us again is uh, Brian Cummings. Uh, Cummins is an amateur astronomer and astrophotographer from Chantilly, Virginia. He is a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador and a member of the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club and started social distancing under starry skies many years ago. Brian, are you out there with the cows tonight or is the weather a little too bad? No, I am out here with the cows tonight, as a matter of fact. Yeah, so um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So, yep. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Brian Cummins. I am, uh, as Stephen said, thank you very much. And Amy, thanks for having me back. I am a solar system ambassador from Chantilly, Virginia, amateur astronomer and uh, astrophotographer. Um, I'm also a member of NOVAC, which is... Uh, the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club. Um, it's actually, I think, the biggest astronomy club in the nation. Um, and we do a lot of things similar to other astronomy clubs around the around the country. Um, we have public nights where the public can come out and look through our telescopes. We can show them lots of different things, show, show them things like we're doing tonight with um, our cameras. Um, a lot of people come out and they're interested in, you know, maybe I want to buy a telescope. Do you guys have advice? Um, they can come out and, and get a chance to look through different telescopes um, and, and talk to people who have used them and, and get a sense for what it actually looks like to look through an image, to look through a telescope and see, which is often a lot different from what we see when we take pictures, as we're going to show you and I'm going to show you tonight. Um, they, we have loaner programs, so you can borrow telescopes. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in seeing some of the things that we're looking at here tonight, um, just do a Google search for your local astronomy club and you're likely to um, find something, hopefully somewhere near you, um, that you can that you can go visit and, and participate. This is where I'm sitting. This is uh, beautiful Sky Meadows Park here. It's a state park in uh, Della Plain, Virginia, about an hour's ride outside of Washington, DC. Um, and I'll show you a picture of the rig that I'm using tonight. Um, there, there are two telescopes here. Um, the one I'm using tonight that we're going to be looking at images through in just a minute is uh, this one here. It's a 127 millimeter refractor um, sitting on an equatorial mount. Um, this little tent over here is something I use to protect my laptop at night. That seems to 
draw interest from time to time, but uh, keeps the dew off, helps keep a little bit warm and also um, keeps the light from my laptop from uh, bothering other people near me. Um, I'm alone tonight, so I'm, I think I'm the only one in the, in the entire state park. So it's uh, quiet and this white light that I'm using so you can see my face fortunately isn't, um, isn't bothering anyone. So what I was planning to do tonight is take a few minutes to show you um, three different uh, emission nebulae. Um, where I'm currently pointing and gathering data is in Cassiopeia or near Cassiopeia. And what we're going to be looking at is a portion of, and Cassiopeia, as I zoom in here, sorry, um, is this, you know, it's funny, um, at star parties, typically, you know, I say, well, it's this sort of M-shaped constellation, or depending if it's, if it's twisted, it's the W-shaped constellation. And I guess it's a sign of the times, but now people are starting to identify it as the, it looks sort of like the scar on Harry Potter's forehead. So um, right now um, we're gonna be zooming in on um, this part of the sky. If you, if we look a little closer, let's see if I can sort of move it. Um, I am right here in this area of what's called the Heart Nebula. The Heart Nebula, its designation is IC1805, and it's about 70, I think it's 7,400 light years from Earth. If you sort of use your imagination, you can see a, a heart there. Um, it's an emission nebula. So we were just talking about a planetary nebula. This one is an emission nebula, where it's a large area of dust and gas that is being, the, the, the gas is being ionized by nearby stars, which are causing it to light and send off photons and, and emit their own light. So I'll switch over right now to the software that I'm using to drive my telescope and drive my camera. Uh, it's currently running a sequence and we are gathering pictures as they come in. Um, whoops, didn't mean to close that, sorry. Um, so this is what is coming in at the moment. This is, um, it's in black and white because I'm using something tonight called narrow band filters. Uh, typically two different types of filters that we use are narrow band and broadband filters. Broadband filters are typically used for gathering um, color like you would expect to take with a regular camera. Like if you took a picture and you could see it with, you know, your eye or a camera, that's what it would look like in, in broadband. Um, for some of these dimmer, uh, deep space um, emission nebulae like this, um, it's often helpful to use uh, narrowband um, filters. Narrowband filters filter down to a more specific frequency of light. This one happens to be um, filtering out most of the light except what is being emitted in similar to the, the spectrum of hydrogen alpha. Um, so that's what we're seeing here is essentially light, mostly light that's in that, in that spectrum. A new image just came in, which is why it looks a little bit different. So this part of the um, of the heart nebula, it's the bottom is uh, some people call it the fish head nebula. I don't know, maybe you can see one there. I sort of see a head here and, and gills over here. Um, it's kind of an interesting one um, to look at. I, I was showing you this because I'm actually working on a, a bigger picture of the um, heart nebula. It, it, th this object for me is so big, it will take uh, four panels uh, for me to put that all together. And I'll show you in a minute um, sort of what that looks like. But what I may do is send the telescope off to, let me just stop this real fast and send it off to the next object. And hopefully it will, uh, let me just do that real quick. I'll cancel this. And I am going to, sorry, I'm gonna send this off hopefully to the next target. What Brian is right. saying is he hopes his telescopes lose. <laughs> I hope it's loose properly. Yeah, I'm a little worried. Yeah, okay, it's on its way. So while it's doing that and getting itself settled, I was just gonna show you, we were just looking at um, the fish head nebula, right? This is a picture that I um, worked on where I took it from black and white, has started to convert it to color. And I was mentioning that this is sort of part of a, of a bigger image, which is going to be um, a multi-panel mosaic. Think of it sort of like stitching together a quilt. And I just wanted to show you, you know, while my camera's moving and starting to take additional images, it's a little bit of how the sausage is made, right? It is, is for some of these bigger images, you actually have to stitch together um, multiple images, depending on, you know, the focal length of your telescope scope and the, the size of the chip of your camera will determine how much of a field of view you can get. 
Um, but as you can see later with the software, which actually the software that I'm using here now to, to show you this, um, I'll be stitching these pieces together, hopefully getting a, a seamless image that you can actually see um, the full heart nebula. Um, so right now the camera is moving over. I think let's just take a look and see how we're doing. So it is getting settled on the um, what we're moving to next, which is IC1396, which is the elephant trunk nebula. Um, I'm going to have it start taking pictures, hopefully, here in a minute. Um, I'll show you um, what it looks like so from some previous images I took tonight, just so you can, oops, every time you close that little window, it closes the whole thing. Um, not it. There you go. So th this is maybe difficult to see. And I apologize for that. My focuser is trying to refocus. Um, this may be a little difficult to see on your screen. I'm going to show you a finished version. But this is sort of a uh, this ghostly image of, of the elephant trunk nebula. Um, this is what it will look like when the camera starts pulling in actual data. Um, what I will show you, though, is, again, this is another emission nebula. Lots of hydrogen, sulfur, oxygen in that nebula. Uh, I will close this out and show you a final version of what that looks like. Um, let me find it. Not it. I think this, is this it? No, that's part of the heart nebula. Apologies. Here we go. So this was uh, a, a sort of a final image of the elephant trunk nebula. Um, you know, some people think it looks like an elephant trunk. I've heard other people say it's more of a, a grim reaper. Um, but this is the final version where I think there was probably about 15 hours of exposure time that I used to put this image together and, and came together into what I think is a, a pretty beautiful image. Um, we'll see if the camera is working. It looks like it is. It's about two minutes through, 43 seconds left remaining. Um, so I'll tell you what, while that's taking, while it, that's doing its thing, I'll show you my last image. I'm just going to move quick. Um, it's a final image right now. It's, it's not up yet, but it is this time of year. And it's interesting because it's uh, um, this is the time. <laughs> it, it is the season. This is an old image of mine. I'm not going to tell you it's a great image. It's one of the first I took when I was using this um, using this camera. Uh, but this is what some people loosely call um, the Christmas tree nebula. And I figured since we were heading into that time of season, we're getting into the holiday season, I would show you this. It's sort of roughly in the shape of a Christmas tree. At the very top of it here is um, the cone nebula. You can see why it's named like that. Um, but I figured just given the time of year, I would show you the Christmas tree nebula to wish all of you very happy and safe uh, holidays. Merry Christmas to everybody. And um, that's all I wanted to show you tonight, Amy. But uh, again, thanks for having me back. Thanks, Stephen, for the introduction. And um, you know, happy to take any questions, answer as best as I can. I'm just an amateur. I do pretty pictures. I may turn to other guys for more information. But again, thanks, thanks very much, Amy, for, for having me. If we want, let's see. Ah, here's the first image that came in of the elephant trunk nebula. So it's you can see there's not much to it from you know what you can see when we first start and take a single image. It's you know only after hours of exposure time um, do we really get something that's that's you know much more pleasing to the eye and much more much more of a visual thing to look at. So something more like that. <laughs> that's absolutely beautiful Brian like every time I see that you, you know the images that you take they're absolutely beautiful and you know I love to always uh, tell people that you've had an image published in a magazine you don't happen to have that one handy do you uh I might yeah so we I know we were talking I would just about love for people to see that it's a really fabulous image yeah let me see if I've got one and uh, Thomas actually has a really good question for you. If Stephen wants to pop in and, and ask it. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, a couple was, of really good ones. <laughs> yeah, he was wondering how long it took you, experience-wise, I guess, to reach your level of imaging. 
You know, um, so I've been, I think, actively imaging now for um, about four years. Started doing planetary imaging, which I'll be going back to here soon uh, with the big conjunction coming up on the 21st that all of us are excited about. I'm um, very interested in seeing if I can grab that image that night of, of Saturn and Jupiter in the same frame, which will be, um, which will be just a super cool occurrence. Um, so started there and then moved on to deep sky imaging. Um, this should be the one, Amy, that you're talking about. So this was this is uh, a picture that I took of the Andromeda galaxy. Um, this is a galaxy that's up right now. Um, so yeah, almost almost kind of straight overhead. Um, this was um, taken over multiple nights about a year ago. Um, I think there's about 15 hours of total exposure time in that image. Uh, and that was, um, that was actually published in um, Sky at Night magazine, which is a, a publication by the BBC. I was very proud of that, had the magazine hanging in my house. So yeah, it's, um, it, it's a ton of work to create these images it, from, from the time that you spend out in the field or you know, from your home, wherever your telescope happens to be. I come out here to Sky Meadows because the skies are much darker here than I have in my home. I, I live in a relatively close suburb to Washington, DC and light pollution um, just, you can still get good images under light polluted skies. It's just harder and takes more time. And uh, you just find when you come out to a nice dark sky site like this, um, the quality of the images that you get um, makes makes your job a lot easier when you go to process. Because the, you know, part of the game in this in this hobby is is learning how to take the pictures, how to gather the data, um, and then the second part, which is candidly a steep learning curve. Um, you know, is is learning how to process it and learning how to put it all together, make it look pretty, get rid of the noise that's in in the photos. You know, if I um, if I showed you my first picture, which was of the Orion Nebula, which I was super proud of at the time, like I would <laughs> I would cringe to pull it up now because it's a terrible picture, <laughs> but I loved it at the time. But you know, with anything, uh, with any hobby, whether you're going out and doing um, astronomy, just you know, looking through a telescope, it's hard at first. It takes a little while to figure out and figure out how to find things and soon you get better at it. And same, same goes for astrophotography. You chose, if you choose to go down that path is, you know, it starts a little bumpy. It helps if you find a mentor who can help you and show you how to do a few things um, and, and just put some time and effort into it. And, you know, it, it, it's possible to create stuff like this. I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm just a regular guy, do IT professional services during the day. And then on clear nights, I come out here to places like this and do uh, deep sky photography. Brian, can you point out the other two galaxies that are in your image there? Yeah, so for sure, uh, this is another, you know, I'll make this a little bit bigger, just, I know it's small on my screen. Yep, so this down here is another galaxy. I don't remember what Messier catalog that one has, maybe you do. Um, and I think this one back here, if I remember correctly, is is another galaxy in that area. Yeah, it's M32 and M110. Those are the two galaxies there. Yeah, and for those who don't uh, know what he means by that, uh, those designations are are part of the Messier catalog, uh, which is a cool story. Um, there was an astronomer, Charles Messier, French astronomer. Um, I think he late 1700s, early 1800s, if I have that right. I might have those dates wrong. Um, but he was a comet hunter. And when you look in, when you look through telescopes at things like galaxies, at things like nebulae, things like comets, they all to the eye, as you look through the eyepiece, tend to look um, somewhat similar. And Charles Messier created a catalog of, of these objects that he knew weren't comets because they didn't move through the field of stars as comets as comets do. And so essentially he was kind of interesting. I mean, he, he created this catalog of things he wasn't particularly interested in, which, you know, are the things that most amateur astronomers and professional astronomers um, are very interested in. And he created this catalog of, I think it's 110 uh, objects total of things that, you know, I, it's kind of the old one man's trash is another man's treasure. And, um, yeah, so that's when you hear things like M or you hear IC. These are different catalogs that, that uh, catalog objects in the, in the night sky. 
And Brian, I'm, I'm glad that you said that because that, that brings up a good point. So tonight we're, we're also looking at, uh, on the, the Chilean telescopes and the Canary Islands telescopes, we're looking at items from the Caldwell catalog. So you, um, you might see those, uh, those terms um, as we bring up those different platforms for those telescopes as well. So there are a lot of different catalogs out there. Mm -hmm. So I think Thomas, that's it for me, unless you have more questions, sorry. Thomas was asked actually following up there a little bit, wanted to know what uh, a realistic investment of your time that you spend on this uh, hobby, you might say. <laughs> yeah, so um, typically at a minimum, the amount of time that I'll, I will put into an individual image is, is probably 12 to 15 hours of exposure time, um, you know, that's a bigger time investment to get those 12 to 15 hours. Uh, there's some overhead when you're taking um, pictures, it, you know, for, for three hours exposure time is more like four hours of real time once while the camera is doing its thing. Plus driving out here 45 minutes, setting up takes about an hour, tearing down takes about 40 minutes back home. Um, so yeah, when I, this time of year is great because I can be set up by six o'clock at night and, and stay here for a long period of time. Um, but yeah, with, with this hobby, particularly astrophotography, where you're trying to gather lots of data, um, you know, you're talking, talking a lot of long nights of gathering the data and then from, you know, a processing perspective from a time investment, this one, uh, this picture of Andromeda, um, I showed you before I was working on that four panel mosaic of the heart nebula. This one is a two panel um, image where it's broken into two pieces. Um, so it took quite a while. I, I, I probably took spent uh, in terms of processing eight to 10 hours of time to, um, to work on this one, to get everything stitched together properly, to um, get rid of the noise, to bring out the, bring out the detail and the color. So you know, it was a, it's a fair amount of effort, but um, for me, it's, it's very, very rewarding. I had a question if you had a Facebook page or Instagram page that people could ask this and look at your beautiful pictures. So I do have a um, Facebook page. It's my personal Facebook page. So I, I mean, I guess you could look me up and, and be friends with me. Um, I, I, I don't have uh, other than my Astro Bin page. Um, you know, I will I will do that going forward. Is is uh, provide a link to some places where you could see my images online. Uh, typically, I just post them, and you know, my my friends comment on them and and like them, and and I print them around and and have them in in my house as well. But um, yeah, I got to think about how I would get that out to you. Maybe I'll maybe what I'll do is um, put some of these up on my Astrobin page, and I will add uh, a note to the comments of the YouTube. I guess I could do that afterwards, Amy. Um, so that if you wanted to see more of my stuff, uh, it would be a good link for you to go do that. Okay, yeah, you sure appreciate it, uh, Brian. There's always some beautiful pictures that you get to show you show us, and we know how much work it, it takes us, and we really appreciate you loading all your stuff up and trekking out to go visit with the cows and enjoy nature and the cows and show us these beautiful photographs. So thanks a lot. I have to say I'm a little jealous of all the guys inside tonight because it's cold out here tonight. <laughs> it's <laughs> it it's like chilly. It yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right, guys. Thank, thanks very much. Sure. My pleasure. Okay. Next up, uh, we have John Carter. He's uh, <clears throat> from Prescott, Arizona. John began his amateur astronomy hobby in 1986. And he is currently the president of the Prescott Astronomy Club. John is um, <clears throat> volunteer. He volunteers as a facilitator and instructor for the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Yavapai College in Prescott, Arizona, where he offers short classes on astronomy and Apple products to seniors. John dabbles in astrophotography in his spare time. So, John, you're up. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, um, I'll give you a little lead here. I'm going to share my screen with you. And when I as soon as I find out which one I'm going to share on this one. I know it's one of these up here. Can't be that one. 
There it is. Okay. So as he mentioned, I'm the um, I'm with the Prescott Astronomy Club, and that's in Prescott, Arizona. And we pronounce it Prescott like biscuit instead of Prescott. Uh, this is one of the things you learn when you first move out here. You find out this is a Western town, and it's uh, got the oldest running rodeo in the in the United States. And we do that every July, I believe it is. So. The PrescottAstronomyClub.org is our uh, site for that, and that's where you can find out all about us. We also have loaner telescopes for our members, and we do public star parties for the local clubs in the area, like the camps for the kids. They come up from Phoenix, Arizona to Prescott, and we give them a good view of the night sky. So the next part of this Oops, too fast. This is a view of my observatory. It's a 10 by 12 foot aluminum shed that I purchased and then put the whole thing together. The roof is a roll off roof and I built that on the ground separately and then lifted it up with a, the help of a little crane to get it up on top of the rails. And it slides back and forth on garage rails. And what you see on the inside there is my 14 inch telescope and writing on top of that is my 100 millimeter telescope that I use for wide field view. Of course, I can do both narrow field and wide field view with a 14 inch, but it depends on how I'm looking at it. So here we're seeing my uh, imaging camera that I have mounted on the back. I can take that off and turn it around and put it on the front and I can do wide field view from, from that using a hyperlens uh, arrangement on the front. I have my DSLR camera permanently attached to this 100 millimeter up here to give me a permanent wide field. Now it's a color corrected. It's got the IR uh, filter removed from it and it's cooled. So it's a really nice camera to use when I want to take separate pictures from either a narrow field or a wide field. So what I'm going to be showing you tonight is using the camera in this configuration for a narrow field. Now, when I'm talking about a narrow field of view, it's a field of view equivalent to the size of the moon. Now, where we're gonna be looking is we're gonna be looking at NGC 1275. NGC stands for New General Catalog, another one of those catalogs. Now you see this little square in the middle, that's the area of the sky that we're going to be looking at. Then as you can tell here, here's the northeast area, here's the east. So this is giving you an idea of where in the sky at this point in time, actually this, this image was captured <clears throat> for seven o'clock. And what I'm showing you here is a captured image from uh, Sky Safari Pro. Now I noticed the other guys have been using Stellarium. So Stellarium and Sky Safari Pro are different astronomy tools that we use for, for looking at the night sky and figuring out where do we want to point our telescopes to. So we're going to be looking at a galaxy group that's inside here. And the 1275, actually, it's the brightest member of the Perseus cluster of galaxies and is also known as the radio source Perseus A. So here's the equipment, the software that I'm using. It's called SharpCat Pro. I noticed that Brian was using uh, SGP or Sequence Generator Pro and um, the other guys were using something different. So everybody has their favorite. I have another piece of software that I use to capture images and, and control my telescope, but this one seems to be pretty basic and stable for me to do things with. And what you're looking at here in this field of view is a, the galaxy clusters down in this area. So you see a chain of galaxies, and this is the one that we're looking at, 1275 is right there. So 1275, uh, it was one of William Herschel's discoveries. He found it in October 17, in 1786. Now John Herschel included it in the general catalog from observations of the rest and apparently never observed it himself visually. Now, it's a rather faint magnitude of 11.6. Now, if you don't know what magnitude is, uh, magnitude one would be the brightest object in the sky other than the sun or the moon. 
So we, we classify the stars according to their magnitude, how bright are they? And we go to the next magnitude level, which is kind of like, you know, if you take your volume and turn it down a little bit, you're going down in decimals or decibels. And in, for starlight, when we go up in magnitude, like magnitude one to magnitude two, then these are plus, it's actually getting dimmer. Now a minus magnitude is going to be a very bright, bright, you know, like the sun. So this is a magnitude 11.6, which is right at the edge of my telescopes being able to get any kind of an image out of. You'll notice how small it is in this total field of view. So that's what we can expect to see. Uh, but when we get through processing these, what we like to do is take multiple images. And with the equipment that I have, I don't like to spend hours and hours and hours capturing images. So I'm more likely to spend a few seconds. Like this image here was captured in 180 seconds. And what I'll do, and that's three minutes of time. What I'll do is I'll get about 20 to 25 of these things, put them together in a stack, and then process the result from that. So the next field, this is what we see. I'm just blowing it up a little bit here and giving you a little bit better view of what NGC 1275 is like. These are other galaxies in the area. Now it's located around 235 million light years away near the center of the large Perseus cluster of galaxies. And it spans about 100,000 light years and is the dominant member of the cluster so 100,000 light years across is pretty much the same size as the Milky Way galaxy. So this is pretty far away. It's a strong radio source as well. And it's named Perseus A and is also listed as SC84 in the third Cambridge catalog of radio sources. Now it's also a very strong X-ray source. Its nucleus shows emission lines. This galaxy was in Carl Seifert's original list of galaxies with peculiar emission lines in their nucleus. We talked about those earlier. Now called Seifert galaxies, the filaments of gaseous material are moving explosively outward at 1500 miles per second. Let's get a little closer view of that. So the, what I'm showing you here, if you'll notice, uh, you'll see different bands dark, a uh, little bit lighter, much lighter. This is a stack of three different images laid one on top of the other where the stars are registered to where they lay on top of each other. So I'm just showing you here that when I take three images and stack them together, I'm going to get an area here that I'm really not interested in. So I crop this out because this is what I'm mostly interested in right here. So when I crop it and do a little more processing, this is what we wind up with. So down in here, this is the major galaxy. That's uh, 1275. These are the friends around in the area. Now you'll notice over here on this side, this looks more like an, um, a spiral galaxy. These others are called elliptical galaxies because they don't have pretty much a defined shape like a spiral like our, our galaxy does. It's um, invisible light. It appears to show a spectacular collision between two distant galaxies. Now this is really something else. Let me show you that. This is the NASA APOD picture of the day, astronomy picture of the day. This was done and uh, submitted in 2008. So notice all the, the, the array of light you've got from this and, and how you've got these radial arms spewing out from the top of it. Now it's an active galaxy and it's the central dominant member of a large and relatively nearby Perseus cluster of galaxies. It's also a prodigious source of X-rays and radio emission. It accretes matter as entire galaxies fall into it, ultimately feeding a supermassive black hole at the galaxy's core. This stunning visible light image from the Hubble Space Telescope shows galactic debris and filaments of glowing gas, some up to 20,000 light years long. The filaments persist in this galaxy, even though the turmoil of galactic collisions should destroy them. What keeps the filaments together? 
Well, we don't know for sure. Recent work indicates that the structures pushed out from the galaxy center by the black hole's activity are held together by magnetic fields. Now, the long gaseous filaments uh, emitting hydrogen gas stretch out beyond the galaxy. The mass contained in a single thread is typically one million times the mass of our sun. The filaments are only 200 light years wide and often very straight and extend for up to 20,000 light years. So that's the uh, NGC 1275. I would have shown that in you know, real time tonight, but we have clouds here in Arizona, so I'm not able to actually show you anything in real time. But I have some other things that I can show you where I've taken pictures before. This is the Cocoon Nebula. Uh, why it's called the Cocoon Nebula, I'm not really sure. It looks like it's enveloped in a cocoon. So you can see the dark uh, area around it. And this is mostly hydrogen because of the red color. And the red color identifies that it's a hydrogen gas. Next, I have the Ring Nebula. Uh, we have very similar to the Helix Nebula. This is the Ring Nebula, but uh, the center star on this one, the little white dot in the center, we believe that's the origin of, of this nebula as this star shed out its outer uh, layers of gas. And then I have the Dumbbell Nebula that I took. So you'll notice there's not too much definition in this because I've really zoomed in a lot on this to give you a more uh, close-up picture of the Dumbbell Nebula. When I actually take this picture in the field of view, if the field of view was this whole thing, the Dumbbell Nebula would only be this big. So just to give you an idea, you have to blow things up like this is all blown up. We have to blow it up visually so that we can see what's actually inside there. Well, thank you very much for the time that I've taken to show you what I'm doing. And if you have any questions about uh, my, my projects, uh, I'm currently making my 14 inch telescope available to anyone who wants to use it for citizen science projects. It's available to the members of the Astronomy Club here in Prescott. So we, I know not everybody has their own telescope, especially one that's permanently mounted and that can be act, accessed remotely. So I do all of my observing inside my house. So I have a connection between my house and the observatory. So I don't have to be out there like Brian in the cold. Brian, suffer. <laughs> but I know you're having a good time out there. And I really appreciate your uh, work that you're doing. Now, what I don't know is, uh, am I still alive? You're still alive. Good. So every once in a while, my, my internet freezes on me, and I don't <laughs> even know if I'm uh, talking to people. No, very, uh, very good presentation. Actually, Amy had a, um, had a question for you a while back right. of your original uh, photograph that, that you showed us of all of the galaxies. Um, see, it looked like there was a lot of galaxies there. Do you know how many galaxies are, are identifiable in that photo? Oh, yeah, almost everything that's a, a smudgy spot is a galaxy. So I'm pointing them out here. Those are galaxies. This is a galaxy, galaxy. There's a galaxy there. And we have um, another galaxy hiding back in here. So there's a, and here's a galaxy that's fairly faint. Yes, there's lots of galaxies. There's one down here that looks like a spiral galaxy and one right down here and here. So we have lots of galaxies in there. Amy said she counted about 21, so. There might be <laughs> or more. Uh, actually, because, you know, what, what Hubble did was when we pointed it at a small dark spot in the sky, probably no bigger than in the tip of my arrow here, they found, what, uh, 10,000 galaxies in that little area? It's amazing. Yeah, we, uh, wow. we aim in a dark spot. All of the flecks, little, even the tiniest flick on that image is a galaxy somewhere. Yes. That's called the Hubble Deep Field, and then they had the Hubble uh, Extra Deep Fields. It's just amazing. 
So you're either looking at hundreds or even thousands of galaxies in that one photo then. Well, the other galaxies are, they're going to be so, you know, like this might be a galaxy right there, but it might be a star. We would have to zoom in on it a little bit more to see if it has any definition to it. If it's got definition to it, like a round dot, then it would be probably just a star. But even that round dot could be the core of a galaxy and we don't really see the haze around a, a star field around the galaxy. So yeah, there could be hundreds of galaxies in here, but you would have to really do a lot of pixel peeping to get down in there and figure out which one is a galaxy and which one isn't. Now this is a single shot image of 180 seconds. So if I, if I did a five minute exposure, these galaxies would really stand out. Wow, did that answer your question, Amy? It did. I was, I was really excited. I was just sitting there pointing and counting. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, John, for everything you've done here. And uh, we really appreciate you coming on and sharing what you have to show us. Well, I was really short and sweet on this one. Well, we sure appreciate it. With that, I'm going to turn it back to Amy. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you to all of our presenters tonight. So um, first, I'm going to tell everyone that we were going to move on to a globular star cluster. And uh, it appears that, that Chile 1 is just having a night. Rock night for that telescope. So instead, um, we're going to jump around uh, just for a minute, and we're actually going to hijack some other telescope missions <laughs> um, and kind of see what what's going on um, that other people that other people are doing. And uh, I invite any of the presenters tonight to jump in um, if you see something interesting. So um, in just a, in just about five minutes here, we actually have another really neat object on a different telescope, I promise, um, <laughs> that we're going to, uh, that, that we're gonna take a look at. But I just wanted to, to make sure that everyone knows sort of the situation that we're in um, so that you're not um, disappointed um, and, and really have a good understanding that we don't, we don't really control, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna click on uh, you know, a couple of things and, uh, and see where we're at. Um, and if it doesn't work out, well, we'll, we'll sort it out. <laughs> um, but thank you all so much for your patience. And, uh, I'm going to hope that it changed it. It didn't. That's okay. So, um, right now happening on the Chile too, who has, uh, heard of the Horsehead Nebula? Somebody talked about it earlier tonight. Yeah. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm actually going to take us out and uh, hopefully for a second here or two, we're going to look at the Chile 2, um, which we already talked about. Okay. Um, so we already talked about the Chile 2. So I'm going to quickly share the screen and yep, right there. Let you guys uh, see that. Okay. And that might change um, very quickly. So I know that we're right at the end of a cycle um, for this telescope. But the Horsehead Nebula uh, was discovered by a woman. Uh, we, we talked about that um, a little bit earlier. And what you can see here is it sort of, well, it went away, but it was tipped on its side, okay? So, um, well, now we're getting something equally as fascinating. So, so we're just gonna go with it. Um, who's okay with us just rolling with it for a second? And um, so now we're looking at NGC. 253. We're not seeing your screen, Amy. You're not seeing my screen. It says you are. I'm seeing okay, your well, face. You guys are getting, you know, okay, let's try again. There there that's good. That's, that's good. All right. So what you actually see now is uh, NGC 253. So this is very clearly a spiral galaxy. Um, I personally don't know a lot about NGC 253. So if any of our other presenters want to jump in, um, this was a surprise for me. This is not something we intended to view tonight. Um, so if anybody has um, anything that they want to jump in and talk about, um, but we can sort of use what we've learned tonight and look at this particular galaxy. Anybody go ahead, shout out in the chat, or if any of the presenters want to shout out and say something. Um, about this object, um, what do you see about it? 
It's well, a spiral. I'm, I'm going to read what, what I can see on my screen right here. It's the brightest member of the sculptor group of galaxies. It's often referred to as the sculptor galaxy. NGC was one of the major discoveries of Carolyn Herschel, the sister of William Herschel. And she discovered this object on September 23rd, 1783. And she was using an excellent small Newtonian sweeper of 27 inches focal length and a power of 30 arc seconds. And that's phenomenal. I mean, if you guys think about that, just how beautiful this is and how long ago this was discovered. Um, and John, thank you so much for going ahead and, and reading that out to everyone, because again, this was a surprise. So, and a great surprise um, for us, <laughs> a great surprise for everyone um, watching this evening that we just got an opportunity to see this. Um, so what you're seeing happen on the screen is uh, that what you saw with Brian, that resolution happens over time, okay? So this telescope is taking multiple different images at different wavelengths. So that later, if I wanted to, I could take multiple images of this and stack them over the top of each other so that all of the features uh, will come out in an image, okay? And then of course we would put it through different types of filtering so that we get all of the color um, that comes with this particular cluster of stars. And so we're, we're very lucky. Um, so is Derek still out there? And, and it looks, by the way, Amy, you got a nice oh. satellite that was captured passing through the middle of the image too, that white line. Yes, yeah, I see that. So I'm gonna start switching to yes. our next object, but if you wanna go ahead and uh, since you're out there, Frank, go ahead and tell everyone, that's not working. Okay, um, what's a galaxy? That's where I was trying to go. <laughs> what's a galaxy? Yeah, what's a galaxy, man? I mean, I know, I know what it is. You know what it is. But what is a galaxy? Well, you know, it's a gravitationally bound uh, group of uh, hundreds of thousands, maybe even a trillion stars or so together. So, you know, we live within the Milky Way galaxy, but there's other galaxies out there as well. So when we're looking at images during the star party of uh, nebulas and things like that, those are within our own galaxy, and they're usually within, you know, a few hundred or thousand or so light years away. But when you're looking at this image of the Sculptor Galaxy, this guy's 11.4 million light years away. So the distances here are just vast, and you're looking at a collection of, again, hundreds of thousands or even close to a trillion stars in this single object here. And just think about how many worlds might be included in this one little image. It's pretty mind-blowing. Yeah, wow, so man. another thing is that this is a starburst galaxy. Uh, we're, we're talking mega, 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 mega amounts of, uh, of, of stars that are forming in this galaxy. It's thought that there would have been a collision from a dwarf galaxy uh, a long, long time ago that actually kind of sparked the starburst uh, formations, uh, usually towards the edges of this galaxy. Um, and uh, these spiral galaxies... Um, you know, like this, like the sculptor galaxy are, um, you know, products of, of uh, either usually galactic collisions or uh, generally they're younger galaxies than the much larger elliptical galaxies that uh, are some of the oldest galaxies in our universe. Well, thank you so much um, for, for saying that. And sorry, I've got some audio that always plays. Um, when we see specific images. So um, earlier, Brian, if Brian's still out there, Brian talked about the Christmas tree cluster um, and the cone nebula. Um, so what you all saw was Brian's very beautiful finished image of the Christmas tree cluster. And of course, like I said, forgive me, we're gonna wait for one of our other telescopes to come online. So we're gonna jump a little bit and have a have a really good time um with this tonight so i hope you guys are all um i hope you are having a very good time i'm going to tell you a little bit about this cluster um while we've got it out here unless uh unless our good friend jumps in if brian's out there okay so this is actually a young open cluster and you guys can see that but you can actually see in this image here too that there is uh, something else going on. It's the cone nebula. Okay, so that's what happens. The Christmas tree cluster and the cone nebula 
really come together to create this really beautiful image in the night sky. This is out in Monoceros. Does anybody know what Monoceros is? I can't see the comments, but that's okay. Any of the other presenters? What is Monoceros? It would be a unicorn. It is the unicorn. How wonderful <laughs> is that? That all of the magic of Christmas <laughs> and unicorns comes together um, in one spot. So the Cone Nebula is actually here. Down, down in the uh, lower portion, the Fox Fur Nebula would also usually be there. Um, so Amy, real quick, so the bright star yeah. you see there below that is the Fox Fur uh, Nebula, so it's a reflection nebula, but uh, I think you have to scroll your image down. I think your, 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 the cone is obscured by your uh, all the document files that I see. <laughs> I think this is the end of our image. So oh, okay. for us tonight, yeah, yeah this so is where we're going to stop here. It's cut off right now. The cone nebula is cut off. <laughs> oh, yeah, just down here in the corner. Yeah. yeah. Part of that is cut off. We've got multi layers going on here. So uh, so we've talked about, I, I want somebody to talk about, or I will. Um, we talked about what is a galaxy, what is a nebula? You know, to me, the first thing I think of when I think of a nebula is not just dust and gas and pinks and purples, but I think of the birthplace of stars. It could also be considered the death of stars, too, because when we consider a planetary nebula we or a supernova remnant, that could be defined as a nebula as well. But basically, it could be the life and death. But we were talking about earlier, the universe is the grand recycler, right? From death yeah. comes birth. So from these massive stars that first died off, releasing all this gas and dust, that, that gravity, gravitational wells will form and repopulate as new stars. So I love seeing nebulas personally because it really tells the story of, of, of the history of our cosmos. Uh, and, uh, you know, usually when I, when I present this to elementary kids and I say these are star factories or star nurseries aren't they cute look at the little star they they, they love it so uh, i love that star factories yeah star factories. <laughs> so i do want to let everyone know as well you guys probably see me clicking around up here trying to get through the telescopes and i am finding out that our primary telescopes tonight which are in the canary islands everyone can see here i'm not making this up appear to be offline <laughs> so um something has happened it's probably weather um that can happen quite often for um telescopes that are sitting on an island okay so that doesn't mean we're not going to show you something amazing um we've done a little bit of jumping around but uh at, unfortunately i do have to apologize to thomas because all of his objects are on the canary telescopes um <laughs> But uh, um, I'm going to go ahead uh, with everyone's permission. I'm going to actually jump back to some objects that I had previously imaged. Um, and I'm going to show some of those to you. So this was an object we were going to view tonight. It is the flame nebula. And this is an object that, uh, so I've already previously taken an image of this, but this was actually our capstone image for the evening, but I love it so much that I want to share it with you now. So you know that I took this image live last night, about uh, nine or 10 o'clock last night, I think. And, um, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Flame Nebula. And I hope if I maybe turn off my video, it'll make it wide. Does it make it go the whole way across so you can see everything? Um, so the Flame Nebula is part of the Orion Molecular Cloud Complex. So which one of our presenters out there wants to tell everybody, what is a molecular cloud? What happens in a molecular cloud? You guys are hurting me. Okay, well, it's basically um, one of the uh, densest uh, pieces of gas that you'll find anywhere in the local universe that uh, you've got um, gas and dust that are cool enough where, you know, normally when you, when you find gas out in the universe, it's uh, uh, atomic or even highly ionized, but if it's cool enough and dense enough, then it can, uh, then those atoms can combine into molecules and the, um, 
all of that uh, gas and dust can be thick enough where it starts to be opaque uh, and even condense into stars. You know, in a very real sense, um, you know, stars condense out of molecular clouds an awful lot like, um, you know, raindrops condense out of uh, water clouds on Earth. So uh, right up here, I don't know if everybody can see, but then my background is actually the Lorian molecular cloud complex <laughs> with We're my so other person here. Like if you look right here, this uh. is the uh, Horsehead Nebula and the Flame Nebula right here and with the star Alnitak on the lawn right up here in Mintaka way up here. Uh, and then over here we have the Orion Nebula uh, and then we have Barnard's Loop, which is this big, dense hydrogen cloud. Uh, we also have M78 over here. So this whole area is just part of this massive cloud of hydrogen gas and oxygen and other uh, trace gases as well that formed um, in this area of the, uh, of the universe, <clears throat> or the galaxy, I should say. Well, Derek, thank you so much. That's wonderful. So, um, so if we look back at the, the primary image, you actually can see on the top there, blasting out of this image. And it was a very, um, I think for me, um, I'm going to call it my lucky shot, right? And this is, does not show all of the gases uh, because I haven't processed this image yet. Um, and so as we've talked about a lot this evening, um, processing images is really important because if you look off to the side of on the top and, and down, you can almost sort of see in there that there's something orange, um, very, there's a very light veil of orange there. And if I actually go in and start processing um, and layering images together, then you all of these colors of these gases would come out. And it's not just this small ball of orange that, you know, of course it does look like a flame right now, but it's a much larger um, cloud um, in reality. And so I, I'm hoping if I sneak back here, everything about my whole system is angry today. Um, so so, while you're doing that, I got a question from Nick was wondering why there's such an abundance of dust and gas in our universe, or do we even know why? Ooh, who wants to take that? I think that's a frank question. Oh man, I just take pretty pictures. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, that dust comes from somewhere, right? So it does kind of like tie into the story about, you know, how stars, you know, give birth to nebulas and, um, you know, as stars explode or, uh, you know, the, the shock waves from those exploding stars interact with the gases around it, uh, that can create these heavy, heavier um, elements, right? And that's kind of where the stuff of the universe that we're all made of comes from. Um, so it's just through this iterative process. I mean, the, the guys who are real astronomers should jump in and like tell, you know, embellish on this if you want to. But, you know, that's, uh, that's where all the stuff in the universe comes from. That's where that dust comes from. And it's just this iterative process of, uh, again, death and rebirth that uh, Derek well, was we're talking very lucky. about. You guys can see that I'm, oh, dang it. I was jumping around and we got a star cluster for a second, a globular star cluster. <laughs> oh, so close. You know, my know, telescope's so still up if you... <laughs> so close. Uh, those canary telescopes are still offline. I mean, we've still got some some cool things going on live here. This is, um. so I just want to point out, this is uh, NGC 1433. And uh, this particular object is what is breaking Chile 1 this evening. <laughs> it is just stuck um, taking uh, repetitive images of um, this particular galaxy, which is a sparred viral... <laughs> Sparred viral, it's a, it's a barred spiral galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so uh, we're just stuck in this mission. Um, it's really interesting to look at um, the telescope is obviously having some issues tonight. Um, you can see that through the grainy image um, as well. This would normally be a very clear image of this particular galaxy. So I do, but I do want you guys to see that because it's so clearly, a barred spiral galaxy. And there are different types of galaxies that we look at um, in the night sky. And why this one is so clear is that you can just see that, that rectangle <laughs> um, right through the middle. Um, and so I actually would encourage everyone, if you go to a place called um, zooniverse.com um, or maybe it's zooniverse.org, there's a, there is a mission on there right now that the public can participate in where you classify galaxies and you're looking at basically an image like this one. 
um, that you're seeing tonight taken um, taken by a telescope or it's a simulated image and it shows you um, a different type of galaxy and then you get to classify it. And why that's really interesting and very cool is because then when you come back to a star party like this, no matter what telescope it is or what our quality is for the evening, um, it's obviously very cloudy um, out in Chile right now. You know, so we're getting a lot of interference here, um, but you can still tell basically what you're looking at. And I, I think that that's so interesting and so very cool. Um, we're gonna jump back over here and again, we're surprised because I do not know what NGC 1055 is. It's very clearly a galaxy and we are looking at it edge on. Um, edge on means that we're not looking right down into the core um, from the top down, but that we're looking at the sides. So we're looking at this one almost edge on. It kind of looks like a smiley face. Um, if one of the other presenters would like to rescue me. <laughs> That's a pretty obscure one, actually. It doesn't really have a common name. It's uh, it's in Cetus. It's an edge on spiral, like you said, but- uh, it's, on, it's in Cetus. What is Cetus, Frank? Oh gosh, Derek would know the lore of that more. I believe it's a whale, isn't it? It's the it whale. Is, it is the monster. It, it is well, it depends whale. on how you look at it. Some people say it's a whale. Some people say it's a, a monster similar to kind of what you see, like a, uh, like a, I wouldn't say Godzilla like monster, but it's definitely some people see it like a like almost like a big giant sperm whale type creature. Um, and other people see it with like almost like a swamp head. And anyways, it was a monster that uh, was created by Poseidon um, as a um, as, as a creator of tidal waves um, and defended the seas, but also was used as a potential source of the demise of Ethiopia, Cassiopeia's home if she wasn't going to sacrifice her daughter Andromeda to it. So uh, quite. Yes, yeah, she had to, that is, uh, if you know the tales of uh, mythology, then you know that she tied her daughter to a rock, uh, chained her to a rock in the ocean and she was saved by who? Perseus, <laughs> okay, Perseus. And what's Perseus interesting is that- Pegasus. <laughs> And uh, Bon Pegasus, and using the head of Medusa, turned the monster into stone. And it's actually thought that the uh, Rock of Gibraltar is thought to be the ancient monster, Cetus, turned into stone. So, kind of an interesting. Uh, I mean, that's uh, really cool, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was actually Hercules who broke the, the monster and, and created the Straits of Gibraltar. So, so, Perseus created the rock of Gibraltar. Hercules later on crushed it and turned, created the Straits of Gibraltar. So, kind of an interesting mythology right there. Um, I love that. No, and I really appreciate it um, that you're sharing that. So, I'm actually going to share earlier um, tonight, we talked about the Orion Nebula. This is not the greatest image I've ever taken of the Orion Nebula, but because we talked about it several times tonight, um, and we'll actually finish up here. Um, the Canary telescopes don't appear like they're going to come online for us tonight, um, but I did also take this image with one of the Canary telescopes. So I will invite you all to please come back um, in January um, so we can um, actually use the Canary telescopes live. Um, when they're not, they're not hampered by weather, but um, this is a really interesting way to look at the Orion Nebula. This also, I took live last night. So I do want you guys to know th this image has not been processed um, either. And so you see all of those different types of gases um, and excuse me, star formation um, is occurring in this space. So like we talked about already, nebulae are places of both birth and death. And they're a place where really, really violent activity happens to make something so beautiful um, for us to look at. Amy, do you have time for one shot? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna show you an image here if you'll let me uh, do this. So what I'm gonna be looking at here is The Christmas tree nebula. So this Ooh. is a shot. This is 30 frames, 60 seconds each. And down here on this corner is the Hubble's variable nebula. 
and that's NGC 2261. And on the opposite corner is an open cluster, NGC 2259. But right in the middle, this is Monoceros. Monoceros, however you want to pronounce that. But there's the Christmas tree, here's the cone nebula. And we have just a fantastic star field. And this was taken with my Canon 6D on the 100 millimeter. That is phenomenal. That is me. So uh, I think it, it, to close out, this is an interesting time to ask you, John and Brian. So we're using these pretty large telescopes. Uh, you know, the, the telescope in Chile is 17 inches. Um, the one that we've been using tonight, it's a 17 inch telescope. Why is it that, um, that you guys are getting such beautiful, clear images? Um, they're high resolution and they're absolutely phenomenal. Um, while well, we're seeing something a little bit smaller and in some cases a little bit more grainy, uh, what's going on there? I mean, I'm happy to answer. jump in. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, you know, some of the things that we're looking at tonight, I think some of those images that are coming out of, um, you know, some of the, some of these telescopes are, you're looking at single images. Um, and, and, you know, if I look at a single image coming off of my camera, uh, which is black and white when we start, it, it's as grainy as that, if not more grainy. Um, it's a combination, what, what helps make those images beautiful and clean and, and, and clears up sort of that graininess is taking lots of individual called sub exposures and then stacking them using software, putting those all sort of stacking them all on top of each other, which essentially creates sort of an average of, of the pixels of each pixel. And what that does for you is for the area that you're trying to image, like the beautiful picture you had of Orion, the, the, the goodness sort of averages in and the, the graininess, which is noise, which is just a, a byproduct of, of taking the images um, is, um, and by the way, you, you can see the noise like on your cell phone. Like if you if you take a picture in low light conditions and it looks sort of grainy, that's the noise. And that, that's part of what's being generated uh, in the process of getting an image off that, off that chip. We have the same thing with astronomy cameras. Um, a dedicated astronomy camera like the one I'm using, part of the way we combat that is um, most of them are cooled. The chip that I'm using tonight that we were taking images with was cooled down to minus 20 Celsius. Um, that helps reduce the noise and keep that noise low because heat tends to generate noise. Um, but that stacking process, going back to that, it, it, it averages out all that sort of graininess that's sort of random. Um, the stacking process has a way of, of averaging that out and building what's called the signal to noise ratio. And the signal is what you're trying to image. And the noise is sort of that background stuff that, that makes those images look bad. And then on top of that, uh, you know, in the end, we also have tools in, in some of the processing um, software that we use um, that have noise reduction algorithms that we can apply to the images that can kind of compare pixels next to each other and figure out maybe what, what's grainy and, and what's not, and sort of smooth out some of that noise to get something that's more visually appealing than you have in a you know, single frame shot that looks really grainy and, and you know, not, so, not so appealing. So I can show you a, a preview of the single shot for that same image. So this is the single shot image. That's just 30, uh, 60 seconds long, single shot. And then this is the same thing when you take 30 of those and stack them together and process it and take out the noise. Yeah, and you, you do that with Hubble too. In fact, you, you have to because you get cosmic rays and you, you have to uh, somehow figure out which frames have the cosmic rays and which ones don't. But you know, that's, uh, there's no escaping. That's how you get better images. Well, that was, this has been absolutely phenomenal. And um, as we start to close out, um, I'll let everyone know, uh, Canary 4 has come online. And <laughs> we are, uh, that is, that's not one of our telescopes for the evening. Um, but uh, there is uh, anyone who wants to stick around uh, for the next three minutes um, or so. Uh, there is someone in the queue who has something kind of interesting. Um, if I won't ruin it, I'll surprise anybody who decides they want to stay. Um, 
I'll, I'll give you, it is a galaxy. <laughs> um, right now, um, they are uh, imaging Saturn um, for the mission uh, for the people who own the telescopes. And so we're just waiting for them to finish that mission. Um, and now is actually a really good time to talk to you all about, um, I guess I can start my video, uh, and a really good time to talk to you about something really amazing coming up in the sky and uh, not in the night sky uh, for the United States, but in the evening sky for the Canary Islands um, and for Lisbon. And so on December 21st, Saturn and Jupiter are going to come within just 0.1 degrees of each other. And down here on earth, if you were to hold up a dime, I don't have a dime handy, but if you were to hold up a dime, it's about the thickness of a dime apart. And if you're really good at imagining what the full moon looks like, um, in reality, it's about one fifth the diameter of the full moon um, from our apparent view from Earth, right? They're still going to be you know, over 400 million miles apart in space, but we will get to see them as they almost kiss, uh, kind of like teenagers at a school dance. They have been doing a pas de deux for the whole year and they're going to come very close together. And the last time they came this close together was in 1623, uh, but they were only 13 degrees away from the sun and it happened in the daytime. So uh, nobody could really see it. Uh, now 1623, by the way, was about 14 years after Galileo built his first telescope. So we also didn't have social media. Uh, nobody was sending a pigeon to tell you to look up into the sky. So we're telling you here um, live tonight and there will be a lot of information from us out on social media um, from everyone who was here tonight. Um, so you won't forget. Uh, the last time this was actually visible was in 1226. So if you're a big fan of the mistletoe tradition at this time of year, 1226 was the height of the Middle Ages and a, probably around the time the Druids were uh, formulating the mistletoe, uh, what is that called? Tradition. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, kind of think about uh, the time frames and how long it has been, almost 800 years since you could see an event like this in the night sky. Now it's not going to be some extraordinarily bright ball of light. Um, I know you've probably heard from the media that it's, uh, you know, maybe the star of Bethlehem or the Christmas star. It's not going to create a tail as big as a kite, um, but they are going to come very close together. And this is really your only opportunity to see this because the next time they might come this close is in 2080. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm not sure I'll be around in 2080. So now is a really great time to step outside. So I think I've, uh, uh, well, I just didn't tell you what time. If you're going to watch the live stream of Maximum Conjunction in the Canary Islands, um, you'll want to find us on Facebook. We're going to live stream that. That'll happen at about 1120 in the morning mountain time. So make sure you do that translation to your time zone. And then if you want to see them pretty close together um, in the evening sky, you'll look to the Southwest. And uh, if everyone in each of your time zones wants to, to tell you about that, uh, now would be a good time to do that as well. Um, in Arizona, it's about 6.40 to seven o'clock is a really good time to look into the Southwestern sky. Make sure you're somewhere, you're not looking into the mountains uh, down here in Rio Rico where I live, we've got to leave. Um, I cannot see that event from my home um, up in Prescott. Uh, John might have a little better chance. And then I think on the East Coast, Derek, it's uh, what about 5.20, 5.30? Yeah, so we have a window about, uh, till about like 6.30, 6.45 before it gets really too low. Okay. I just posted on the chat room an invitation to people that want to join my Zoom meeting that I'm going to be doing that night. And it starts at five o'clock, ends at 6.30. That's my window of opportunity for the Saturn-Jupiter conjunction. I'm going to see if I can get us into this uh, object. So while we're waiting, uh, just it's not going to be as close and 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 angle, uh, but Jupiter 
Saturn conjunctions do happen every 20 years, and the next one will happen on October 31st, 2040. So it might not be as close, but it's going to happen on Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> that was only kind of scary in the way you said that. Well, it's Halloween. <laughs> We'll see if we're, it's going to let us in here. Looks like they're still doing Saturn, but it's kind of cool. I'm going to show you what it looks like, what they're doing. They'll let me. They won't get mad. So, oh, can everybody see that? Yep, everybody can see that. So, uh, so we're looking at Saturn um, through Canary 4. That's one of the smaller telescopes in the Canary Islands. Um, and what they're doing right now, uh, I'm just going to kind of explain that they're preparing for the conjunction. And so they take a little bit of time at, at different points throughout the day and throughout the night to uh, get a really good look at each of the planets. And so while this is really small, you can still see the rings. You can still almost kind of see some of the features of Saturn. It's not, you know, it's definitely not the Hubble images. Um, that you would normally see, but it is a, it's a kind of interesting uh, view uh, just to kind of know what's going on. So I think that that's pretty cool um, that we're able to see that tonight and know that this is live too. So again, we're, we're talking about live imaging as opposed to stacked imaging. Um, and even though this is much closer, this is a pretty small telescope, right? So this is a, a 14 inch telescope, but um, its job right now is not to resolve the image its job right now is to track the image. And so that's a that's pretty interesting um, that they are doing that tonight. I'm actually really excited, uh, oops, I'm in the wrong spot, to see what they're doing. Um, I do know that I actually can break into any of the other telescopes. Let's see if Chile 1 fixed itself. It apparently did. So, like as our last saving grace, you guys can see the star Alpha Orionis, who knows about this star, Betelgeuse, or, you know, thanks to Tim Burr, Betelgeuse. <laughs> um, you know, so um, very recently, the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard and Smithsonian had a big press release. Um, one of our other scientists who uh, works with Peter um, saw, uh, did observations of the pulsation and that it made a number of people believe that this star was going to go supernova. And she discovered that it was more like a sneeze. Um, so uh, she did, you know, she has been continuing to observe the star. And in the next couple of months, she'll have some new things to say about it. Um, things we can't really divulge um, here and now. But uh, just know that that's coming and definitely be ready to to watch out for information. Let's see if we could get one last, we'll sneak into one last mission. Um, someone else's mission. Oh, they're still looking at NGC 1055. So we'll get one more neat look at our smiling whale monster. And then uh, I will say good evening and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for your patience as we have uh, we are getting a nice blessing as we, we check out of NGC 2070, which is another nebula. And uh, we won't take time to talk about this one tonight, but thank you so much. Have a wonderful holiday. We'll see you again in January with hopefully much better weather in the Canary Islands. And uh, we'll welcome all of our friends back then too. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night. Good night. Thanks, Amy. Good night. Good night. Thanks everybody. Bye.